Good morning, Gen Con attendees. Good morning, everybody. I uh, am not much of a morning person, so I apologize if I stumble over my words this morning. Hopefully you guys are better at morning people stuff than I am. Can I get a uh, sound check? Is everything clear on the sound today? We're going to give a few moments for people to kind of filter in. Uh, before we kind of get started. Thanks, Skektech. Appreciate it. Ichabod. Dara. Yep. Bell. Hello, Bell. A little bit of an echo. Okay. I'm running it out of a cave this morning, so that could explain the echo. All right, I don't want to keep you guys too long. Those of you who showed up and were on time, um, the rest can just kind of filter in when they come in. So today's session, we're going to be covering a uh, how to create a D and D campaign within Fantasy Grounds, and pretty much everything that's involved with building and, and main, maintaining and running a campaign for Fantasy Grounds and Dungeons and Dragons. Most of the principles that we're going to, we are going to apply today will apply to any rule set that you play, especially any of the official rule sets that we support. There will just be some differences on you know specific uh, items like NPCs and spells and stuff like that, but. None of that we're really going to dive into too much. It's mostly going to be uh, just basically uh, going through and setting up all of the various components you need. Your stories, your uh, characters, I won't delve into too much. I did have a session on that yesterday. If you missed that session and you're curious about how to create characters for Fantasy Grounds, you can go back and look at the sessions on Twitch and on YouTube. Uh, we are broadcasting on Twitch, YouTube, Steam, and Facebook today. And so we've got people from all different areas that are signed in and watching and um, and chatting. So I think I've got it set up to restream the chat, but I will try to read any chat comments that I see and then share those out. Uh, Dave Middleton will be in chat, I think, as well, uh, although I think he may be in a little bit later because this is early, early for him. Uh, but we have Belle in chat, so she can help out as well. Belle is, um, is Paulette. She's one of us, uh, one of the Fantasy Ground Smiteworks folks. So if you have any questions, she'll be there to, to drop links in chat and answer any other questions um, if I don't quite get to it. And I will try to pay attention and uh, make sure that I don't go off script too much for the thing. But we've got you know three hours here. I don't know that we'll need the full amount, uh, but I should be able to you know kind of work through this and, uh, and answer any questions you guys have. So don't feel like you have to hold questions to the end. Feel free to drop them in as they kind of pop up, and I'll do my best to kind of address those. Uh, so, uh, with that, I'm going to switch over and show you the very beginning step, which is Fantasy Grounds. And so, the very first thing you're going to do here is you're going to get to this screen. If you have a license, you'll have to have like um, a non-demo license in order to create content and have it saved and all that sort of stuff. You can play around with the creation tools with just our demo, but if you don't have a license, then uh, you're not going to be able to save and have people connect into your campaign. So. Uh, first thing to do would be either to get a subscription or a one-time license. Just a standard is fine. Uh, An ultimate lets your players join without having to have a license of their own. So uh, once you get that, you can come through and you'll have an option to say load campaign. If I click on that, it'll show you these are all of my campaigns that I've already created and they're for different ones. I've got like 5e or um, Savage Savage World, Savage Pathfinder. I've got a couple different ones here. I do recommend if you make a lot of different games and you switch systems, uh, sometimes putting just the name of the system in your campaign name is, is helpful, uh, but you don't have to. And then on the side here, you'll have a list of extensions that you have loaded for any specific campaign. And then here you will set your password and your chat name and whether you're in the cloud. If you select cloud and you'll have either public or private, what that basically does is that means that when I start this game, it will show up as 5e sample campaign by me, my D Davison user account here. And then anyone that clicks on that within the join game will be able to jump right in and play the game. If you have LAN, then they have to basically connect by your IP address. 
Uh, and then private means that it won't show up in the server list, but I will still show up if I do a join game and put in D Davison. So like if you have a scheduled time that you wanna meet with your players, you can do that as well. And then here's the rule set that I have selected for this particular campaign. So I'm actually gonna go through and show you the join campaign screen just to give you an idea of what the players see. And the top shows your other recent games that you've joined. If that game is active and running at the time that you launch the join campaign button, this will actually show a little green uh, icon here that means the game is actively running, it's online, and you can jump right in to the game by just double clicking on it as a player. Here, same thing, I can do a search for the, the GM name and I can find it there, or I can just kind of scroll through or page through and see. Right now you can see there's 413 games running right now, 307 of which are, are public games, the rest are private. And then you also see there's a little lock icon that means that each of those games has a password. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you do throw a password on there because like for instance, people may jump in and just try to join your game if they're new to Fantasy Grounds and they don't know that they need to probably have coordinated with you uh, in advance. So uh, I'm gonna do create campaign and we're gonna call this the Gen Con 2021 uh, 5e game, D&D 5e. And then here you'll see all of the game systems that I have locally installed on my system. And I can just kind of scroll through and select the one that I want. We're going to do uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition right now. I'm going to select that. And then on the side, these are all of the different extensions that I have. And so I also have a bunch of extensions that I've picked up on the Forge. And uh, Paulette can post a link to that, uh, forge.fantasygrounds.com. It basically has a bunch of extra extensions that our community developers have built. And those will be uh, you know, compatible with different rule sets. So some of these advanced effects and assistant GM, some of these things are really pretty cool. Death indicators is, is super cool. Um, polymorphism allows you to like switch, you know, your characters that are druids and stuff like that can do some really pretty cool stuff. I've only played around with some of these things. Um, and then I've got a bunch of decals and some other stuff that I can turn on or off. But, uh, and then below, let me scroll down a little bit further. So you got decals, features, typically add functionality here. Uh, Kit and Caboodle is a really popular one as well. Uh, let's see, Sirenscape, there's a there's one there where you can link and play sounds from Sirenscape. Uh, this one is one that we've not re released yet, Theater, Theater of the Mind extension. And let's see, themes. Themes, you can only typically have one theme loaded because themes will completely change the look and feel of the interface. Um, one of the ones that comes with, when, with Fantasy Grounds. So all of these FG ones here are ones that we have internally. Um, but there is a D&D &D official one, and um, I'm not going to run that one right now, but it, it is a pretty cool interface. It, it looks very much like the uh, core rulebook. Um, I guess I can turn it on here. So theme D&D &D official. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on that one theme. That's all I'm going to do. And then I will hit start. Oops. I don't want to can't. I don't want a cloud game, though. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm not going to give a password into the GM. So let's try that again. So I'm going to create the game here. It's going to be a local game. While that's loading up, I'm going to switch back over to uh, my PowerPoint and talk about what we're going to cover. So, uh, la, 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 la. all right. So basically, get rid of my FG here. Boom. Okay. So creating a D and D campaign. Now that that's kind of loading in the background, uh, I will go to my next section here. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is just kind of choose which sources that you want to have active in your campaign. So out of, the, out of the gate, Fantasy Grounds comes installed with SRD data, which is system reference data. That's a subset of the player's handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual that Wizards of the Coast puts out for everybody to use. Uh, it has mechanics and um, you know basic stats and stuff like that in there. It'll have a basic version of all of the character classes. Only has a single feat kind of as an example, uh, only a single background as an example, mostly for character builder type stuff, but it does have a lot of NPCs in there. It won't have any of the imagery from the actual player's handbook or the fluff and the rest of the description stuff. Um, so we actually recommend, if you're gonna play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff, I highly recommend picking up like the player's handbook. If you're uh, very heavy into homebrew, I, I recommend also looking at the, um, the Dungeon Master's Guide and like Bolo's Guide, Xanathar's Guide, that sort of stuff. Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide has got great stuff for, uh, you know, maps of the Forgotten Realms and the Sword Coast. So that's a, a really good one for doing kind of additional homebrew. And then there's also things like Ravnica, if you're big into the Magic the Gathering, or Eberron, if you want to just run something in that system, you may pick that up instead. Or completely different and go with something like Stranger Things or Rick and Morty. 
each of those has its own kind of different stuff that you can pull from and use. Now you can mix and match as many of these things as you want and then uh, kind of come back into it. So we're going to jump back into Fantasy Grounds here. Let's turn off my whoops, sorry, PowerPoint here, and then we're going to go back to Fantasy Grounds. All right, so this is what the campaign looks like when it first loads up. Um, Okay, so I'm going to answer a question real quick. Michael T. Murphy said, so where it says choose your sources, I don't see anything for the earlier D&D, A&D, AD&D, second edition, etc. on there. Is it available for this? Uh, the answer to that is yes, it is, but not in the 5e rule set. So remember, one of the very first things I did when I chose in Fantasy Grounds is I chose which game system I'm, go I'm going to use. Within Fantasy Grounds parlance, that's called a rule set. And a rule set doesn't necessarily mean you get book contents. What it means is that the system will understand what... Uh, what data types matter for that specific game system? What kind of automation makes sense? So if you actually play a Dungeons & Dragons 1E, 2E rule set, um, then that would be for like AD&D, and it would have like Thak Thacko in there, in there so that you know that's how that system works, and armor, how its armor values work, all that sort of stuff, will be applied appropriately for that game system. Also, the look and the feel of it will change quite a bit as well. And then when you go in and you look at your library resources, if you've purchased any other content, then it will limit it to only show stuff which is compatible with that system. So as the owner of the company, the president and owner of the company, I've got everything that we have uh, on my system locally. That's why things take a little bit longer for my system to load sometimes. But what happens is um, if I go to library assets, you won't see any AD&D stuff when I go to that. You'll only see things that are uh, built specifically for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition or things which are marked as compatible. So there are some generic stuff. Cool. Uh, we have a license for Fantasy Grounds and Smiteworks has a license to have uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. So we have everything available for it pretty much, um, including a lot of the, not all of the Adventure League stuff, not the early season stuff, but the newer stuff we have license for that. We have a uh, license for pretty much all of the adventures that have been released for the different um, sets and then the, the supplements and so forth. For AD&D, we have a large subset of those, but not a full license for the entire product line. So we don't have some of the spinoffs such as like Spelljammer or um, Dark Sun or Planescape. Um, but we do have, you know, a lot of the, the basic uh, adventures that have come out and any of the rule sets and the game systems that have already been released for fifth edition, we typically can offer those within the AD and D rule set as well. We don't have any license for anything on three and a half, 3.5 or 4E. Um, and so we would love to have those in the system, but we don't have a license to, to support those. So you can still play those systems. You just have to enter your own data. So if you have like, a, uh, if you type it in basically exactly as it is in the book, it'll, it'll do a pretty good job of remembering it. All right, cool. So I think that's answered the question. So uh, this is what you first get. So this campaign setup screen will pop up and you'll see here you, you've got a link to the user manual, the wiki user guides, the forums, all of those are great sources. And then um, you can just kind of click next to look through here. So this is, again, this is talking about sources. So this screen here is kind of like a shortcut way for you to load up. Okay, I want to just load up my SRD modules or my core rules modules or whatever. So before I click here, I'm actually going to show you what that looks like when you just come in fresh. So if I click on my library, you'll see that it's all blank. Uh, I don't have anything loaded in my modules uh, right now. So it says click on the modules button below to add them to your campaign. So if I click on modules, it'll open up a list of everything that I have. Let's shrink this down here. And I can click load on any of these and they will load into the system. So uh, I, can, I can use that, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you if I just click on, okay, I want the SRD stuff. What it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and just basically do those loads for me. And it's loading them up presently. I do recommend that if you uh, are going to be running a game for players that you load up all of the modules that you want to load prior uh, to actually running the game. See, now they're loaded in the background because this, this is a little bit resource intensive when it loads them into your campaign. Once it's loaded, the next time I launch this campaign, all of these modules will already be preloaded for my specific campaign. And the players, when they load it in, won't have any kind of lag or delay or anything like that. So this loaded in the SRD stuff, and you'll see here on the left is my contents. Uh, and then on the right is, or, or th these are my uh, basically kind of like books or modules that I have. And then on the right, it will change depending on which one of these I have selected. So it's just basically two frames that kind of work together. 
So if I go into like SRD magic items, you would expect that it has some equipment and then here it has adventuring gear and you know, some extra weapons and stuff in here that I can then use. And then it'll have uh, obviously probably lots of magic items. So um, inside of Fantasy Grounds, you'll see there are pluses and minuses. That means that I can click on these headings and it'll shrink those sections down or expand those sections there or I can hit minus and it collapses everything and then I can just jump right to wondrous items and now I'm searching for wondrous items any of these buttons if I click on it this is coming from the SRD so you'll see it actually has some descriptive text for this particular item the bag of holding for instance uh, let's see if I wanted to do a search if I wanted to look for everything that says staff I could just type in the search window here, hit enter, and now it's it's limited down to everything with the word staff in it, which also included quarter staff uh, as well. So that's a way you can very quickly kind of um, you know navigate and search and find stuff. All right, so um, modules again to kind of reiterate, modules are collections of data and information. Uh, within each module, some of these modules will have this thing known as a reference manual. Reference manual is accessible from your library for a specific item. In this case, there's not much in this particular one. I'll show something. Um, I'll show something a little bit better, which is like the player's handbook. I'll load that up as well. So here I could load up the core rules that would load those all for me automatically. Uh, or I could again, I can go to modules and I could just say player's handbook and I can click load. And you'll see it'll drop into the side over here. All right, so now it's loaded. And then if I don't want it to load because I want to just uh, you know use other sources or just want to make my load time of the campaign a little bit faster when I first come in, I would just hit unload. And basically on the module screen, there's a few different buttons. So there's load and unload. And then there's the book icon, which just shows whether it's open or not. Basically just another way of looking at unload and load. And then there's this other thing here with a check mark. So the check mark here says player load allowed. If I look at other stuff, like let's let's look at um, Dungeon Master's Guide. So the Dungeon Master's Guide has two different modules. You'll see that we split it up into the Dungeon Master's Guide here, which has an X, which says player load is blocked. And then we have another one that says Dungeon Master's Guide for players, and it has player load allowed. What that means is that within the actual DMG, there are a few things in there that we think players would actually want to have access to and need to have access to. So we've made a little option for this book to be able to be shared with the players directly. When the player logs into your campaign, they will have the option to, when they go to their modules, they will see Dungeon Master's Guide players available that they can click load on. They cannot see this one and they will not see this and be able to load that. If you wanted to change those things and you don't want them to use any of the player material from the DMG, you will drag this little block player load over to here and drop it in. Now that's blocked, and when the players connect to your game, they will not be able to use this content. So if you have a large collection, and let's say you're, you, have, you have a bunch of stuff for Ravnica and Eberron, but you're playing a, a Forgotten Realms uh, game, you might go ahead and lock out those different uh, source materials that you do not want your players to access whatsoever. Uh, but I don't really care about that for this point, so I'm going to put that back to here, and I'm going to go ahead and load that in this. And as a shortcut, I'm going to go ahead and just load up the rest of my kind of core material here. All right, so uh, let's close that down. Here I'm just going to say give me all of the... Uh, I'm going to do all rules. So this will take a little bit to load. I'm going to let it just kind of... <laughs> Tug in the background here. Again, this is why you want to do this before you really have your players connecting in. You do all your campaign prep, uh, you know, in between sessions with players. And then what I like to do when players join the game uh, is I just turn on the game before the players are going to be there uh, and then say, okay, the game will be up for the next, you know, an hour before my game. So I just launch Fantasy Grounds. They can connect to it. They can modify their characters while, while they're connected. They can use any of the sources that you have and then, uh, or that, 
any sources that you have that are marked as player load available and they can build characters, do shopping, whatever they need to do for their characters. Uh, Australis Plays says that um, they did notice that Drive Through RPG does sell D and D third edition and three and a half uh, D and D books as PDFs on their side. That is true. Yeah, we um, unfortunately each company is going to be licensed a little bit differently, and right now we've not had a we've not had permission to include three five stuff. But we have asked from time to time. We do think it would be popular uh, for you know some people. I I personally like I've enjoyed almost every version actually I have, i've enjoyed every version of dungeons and dragons that i've played so i'm a big fan of the earlier versions as well all right so while that's loading i'm gonna switch back to my powerpoint campaign here for a second so all right so we're gonna go ahead and load in these different things uh, another thing I wanted to bring up is that in addition to the sources that we have from our storefront and from the Forge, we also have DMs Guild. Some of those are um, including of modules for Fantasy Grounds. So if you go to DMs Guild, look and see there's a VTT section that you can select and you can limit it to show stuff that has VTT modules. And those VTT modules will often include Fantasy Grounds. So sometimes you will get the PDF plus the fantasy grounds version so whenever you buy those um, you know some of the proceeds of that will also go to smite works as well and then there's also third-party 5e compatible modules and a, a good example of that would be like cobalt press has a lot of stuff goodman games legendary games aaw games uh, lots of people make a lot of great 5e content and you can mix and match that with your official content with ease and i think that's something that's really pretty good um, you know, one of one of the great strengths of Fantasy Grounds is that it's really easy to mix and match content, you know, once you have it loaded. And then you can also add your own homebrew creations. So that's what we're going to kind of play around with all of those things and, and kind of see where that's going to take us. Um, so now the very next step, once I get these loaded, and they are all loaded on my, on my screen here, I'll switch back over in a second. So I recommend that if you have an idea for an adventure that you start off by building an outline of what you want to kind of tackle so if you think about what encompasses an adventure you have story elements which are pretty much all of the paragraphs of text that you use to communicate to a dm or to uh, yourself later on box text that you want to use to communicate to players that sort of thing um, the npcs that fill your world the items uh, that you're going to hand out and, and npcs might use against you that sort of thing uh, images, obviously lots of handouts, lots of maps, tiles that you can use to arrange and build your own maps. And then encounters will be groups of NPCs that you might obviously encounter, including random encounters are, are a thing that we'll go over. And then parcels are treasures that you might have your players find at some point in time. Now, the way that you do these is going to differ depending on whether you're building it for yourself or whether you're building it to, you know, maybe put it up on a forge uh, or sharing with other DMs. So, We'll kind of cover uh, a little bit of both, and then you can decide how much content you really want to put in there, how much extra notes you really want to do. All right, so let's get rid of that again, and we will jump right back into fan screen. All right, so everything is now loaded. Close this. Um, the other section of the campaign setup, I'll cover that as well, is the options screen. So let's customize the options for this campaign. Manage it any times by going to the options button on the upper right. So the options button is right here. So I'm hovering, it looks like a gear. Uh, it may sometimes change a little bit of the look and feel depending on which theme I have loaded. So right now I'm using this theme. This is what the button looks like. So just hover over the things and it'll tell you that's calendar, that's combat tracker, party sheet, colors, and modifiers and effects. And then all of these different buttons down here. This sidebar, this is called the sidebar, this section over here because it sits on the side of the, of the screen in most cases, unless the theme has moved it to someplace else. Uh, that is going to be changing pretty soon here in one of the upcoming versions. We'll, we'll be dropping it into our test channel pretty soon. It will have all of the buttons available and they will be in collapsible sections. So it should be a lot easier to find. For now, however, you will have to go into the options. So uh, just showing real quick, these are all loaded in. So you'll go into your options and then right now currently and again this is going to be changing very very soon uh, is the sidebar button here so this basically shows let's do 
if you have any window here, I like to use control and then just I hold down control and then click and drag in the middle and I can basically change the shape of any window. So if it's like really small like that, I don't want to scroll. I can just kind of spread it out. So you'll see me do that a lot whenever I open windows. Uh, I normally run on a much bigger display, but because I'm streaming it, I have to kind of fit everything into this little 1080 window. But I, if you have two monitors hooked up and you're going to be a DM, I do recommend stretching your screen across both monitors or getting an ultra wide or, you know, something like that. The more real, real estate you can, you can give to Fantasy Grounds, uh, you will be rewarded for that. So here you can see on the side, the buttons are going to be depending on which buttons I select. So classes was not shown and I clicked on it, classes shows up. Um, notes, I can turn them on or off, that sort of thing. So if I want to say I'm in GM mode, these are the buttons we expect that you will use as a GM mostly. These are the buttons for play that we think you will use as a player. And then create PC. When you're creating a PC, you need characters and backgrounds and classes and all that kind of stuff. Um, or you can just hit all, turn out all of the buttons on, and they'll all kind of squeeze in at the end of the side there. So I'm going to probably going to be in GM mode because I'm not creating characters uh, at this point in time. So that's how you can change that. Some of the other things, we're going to go through the options again because we've got lots and lots of time here. Scroll through these and see what they all say. And then you'll see there's a link here you can put into a, into a um, chat bar down below, a hotkey bar down below so that you can refer back to it later. You have things like languages and currency. So if I open up my languages, these are the languages that are going to be in my world. So the language is here. And then this other column here is going to say, well, what will it look like when you actually, you know, in that language? So let's make, okay, that's maybe going to look deep speech. Maybe it looks uh, kind of like an infernal, for instance. So what that means is now in the chat window, if I select deep speech, who goes there, it will render it like this. Basically, it chooses, it marries it up with which font you want to use. Uh, if I was to change it to like, say, uh, Elvish. It will look more like Elvish script. And then any of the players who have that language listed will um, have that information. All right, currencies. This is going to be preloaded with default currencies, but you can come, come through and manage it. Like if you're playing, let's say you're playing Dark Sun and you have a different set of currencies, you can modify that here. Um, but Knox says, so the sidebar will be like the menu and the AD and D rule set. That's correct. Um, so the AD and D rule set has a different kind of like top floating menu here with drop downs. So it has a different look and feel to it. Cool. Uh, all right, let's see. David says they would like to see the plane shift Zendikar module become available to purchase. Um, yeah, some of the plane shift stuff we would, uh, I was thinking we had some of that out there, but maybe we need to go back and revisit those if we've missed some. Because at first, I don't think we were able to do those. But I thought we had Zendikar, plane shift Zendikar out there for some reason uh, as a free module, I thought. Uh, all right, so let's see. Dice, manual entry mode is if you're going to be rolling dice to hit for monsters, uh, it will prompt you. I can show that off really quickly if you want. Um, this I don't want to really make this about like how to use uh, Fantasy Ground so much. It's just let's we're going to focus on kind of campaign building. So maybe I'll, I'll skip that one for now. But basically, you can turn that on or off, play with it. It'll prompt you when you have some stuff. Uh, but you basically do want to set up how you want your stuff to work. So this... Uh, set GM voice to the active combat tracker is sometimes pretty nice. Like if you have a bunch of goblins, stuff like that, whenever you are typing and you're in the, in a combat mode, it'll automatically shift this for you. So you don't have to turn it on separately. That back to basic. So I like to have that on uh, show GM roles. I often like to have that turned on. Um, and then the other thing that kind of goes alongside that is going to be the, um, the dice tower. So, the decal image, this is just visibility. Um, change it to be a couple different things. Um, or you can make custom stuff that you use too. So we can use D&D one. You can also uh, use it from your assets, open up any image, and then say, make that my background decal, and it will drop it in here. If it's transparent, it will just overlay it in the background. Uh, let's see. Show characters to clients. I like to have that on. Inventory to clients, I like to have that on. That will be on the party sheet. And then table dice tower drops it down here below. Under combat, how do you want your NPC initiative to do? Since we're 
you know, when I'm running in person, a lot of times I'll do groups. So like if I've got five goblins, all my goblins go at the same time. Uh, since we're using a computer and it does it all for you automatically, um, I often like to just have it number them individually so that you've got different goblins moving at different times. I find that that leads to many fewer, to a little bit better strategy for the players, a little bit better tactical options where they can kind of see which goblin is about to act and they may choose, all right, between uh, goblin one and goblin two, I'm going to knock out the goblins coming next and then hopefully one of my allies will be able to take out the the subsequent goblins. I think it it makes it a lot easier. It reduces the chances of TPKs where that's where your entire party is wiped out because five goblins all went at once and they all went over and smacked the same person and took them out of action. So I like to have that on. Uh, NPC numbering, let's see, NPC rolls, Vixter, all of these things, you can kind of play around with it here. Um, some other things that I like to turn on just to kind of show you, say so show ally health. Um, I always like 100% grid. I like bigger icons wound categories do you want it to say wounded or do you want it to really like delve into how wounded they are basing indicators if that's something that matters to you in your game that's not a thing in D&D um, &D fifth edition um, but it would be a custom house rule that you might turn on or off uh, party vision and movement do you want your players to be able to see what everybody else in the party sees or do you want their vision to be locked uh, separately and let's see what else we got here. Uh, NPC death rolls, all that sort of stuff. NPC hit points. Do you want it to be standard or do you want it to roll? I like to turn on random personally. That way, if I've got five goblins, I've got some goblins that are stronger than others. Yeah, and then that's basically kind of it. So that's your main setup. If you need to get back to that setup screen, just click setup and you're here. Uh, message of the day is something if you're running a campaign then I like to use this to say, welcome back from spring break. Don't forget to level up to level four before the session. So if you're going to have your, your game running beforehand, then just turn something on like that message of the day. When the players come in and when they log in, they will see that automatically. And uh, that was a, a developer, community developer, add-on that was very popular that we ended up just kind of building our own version within fantasy grounds directly um, token lights you can also modify you know what does a lamp mean what color do you want it to use how far does the brightness go out versus dim how quickly does the light fall off all that sort of stuff and um, you can kind of modify those things all right so that's campaign setup um, we will jump right into the next step, which is going to be stories. Oh, I guess I can show you one more thing. Sorry, before I jump off too much. So I mentioned before about you know how the SRD, some of those have reference manuals. Most of the reference manuals don't look that great, except if you click on an actual official book, this is what an official D&D book content will look like. So you'll see here, it looks very similar to like a PDF and you can kind of, uh, you know, next, next, next your way through this. And you've got, you know, something that you can kind of read and follow along. So what's really nice about this is that any of these images, let's find. Uh, this talks about the various classes. Let's see if I can find. Uh, let's say you want to talk about the island kingdoms, for instance, or the moon shays. So let's say if this is a map you wanted to use, you could just click on it, pop it out. And now you can share this map to the players by right clicking, say share, share the record. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, use those sorts of things. If this is a page you want to refer back to a lot, then you can click here, pop it out. And now you got that page kind of torn from the book. And you can drag this down to the hotkey bar down below. Now coming into the dev channel very soon, uh, and then the test channel as well, will also be a reference manual builder. So what I'm going to show you today is going to be doing a lot of stuff within the story section. Uh, story sections are great because you can do basically everything that I'm doing here just about you can do except you can't do the really nice styling where I want this to have a nice looking breakout and uh, I want to have an images kind of let's see if I can find some side by side images here. You can have like two column comment uh, content with an image on the right and text on the left all that sort of stuff. You can't really do that level of, of development within the story section and what you see is what you get format. 
but you can um, you can within the new reference manual builder that we're going to do, you'll be able to add your own content, drag and drop stuff in, and then build it out to look basically exactly like our existing reference manuals. You'll be able to build that yourself and export it uh, if you would like, or just use it as a reference. All right, but we are going to dive ahead to stories. So stories are kind of the next section uh, that we do. So let me show you, let's see what we're going to focus on here. Our um, couple different things. So we have story. Stories include like body text, chat frames, headings, lists, links, and tables. So we're going to cover each of those really quickly. Turn that back off. All right, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to go to story. And you'll see by, the, by default, story is going to be completely blank. I just created this campaign. There's nothing in it at all. So I'm going to start building out an outline of something. And in the side I've got, I happen to have a D&D module a PDF from Out of the Abyss open. I'm going to use that, copy and paste from that quite a bit so that you don't have to sit there and watch me um, do stuff. So on the bottom of the screen, you'll have an add item section. And you'll see as I click on that, it makes a new story entry. And then I can type whatever I want in here. So I'm going to actually use... As an example, let's see, page 39, let's jump to that. Give me some content that I can use. Yeah, this, this should work. All right, so I'm going to call it chapter three, the dark lake, all right? And so here, you're just going to click in here and you're going to type in some text. So type in whatever you want. I'm going to just put in a little bit of paragraphs of text here, paste it in. And because I pasted it in uh, from a PDF, it's going to PDFs automatically have a carriage return line feed after each one. So that doesn't look great. You can kind of come through and just hit delete and clean that up like that. Type in whatever you want. Or you can kind of just select a group of it, select a whole paragraph and, and hit the keyword control J. And so if you look at our wiki for formatted text, um, maybe maybe Bell or somebody can find that in our uh, in our wiki and, and post a link to it here while I'm chitting, chattering around. Uh, but then you can also do things like you can right click on this and I can say paragraph types and I can say, do I want it to be a body text, a heading, a chat frame, a list, or a link, or a table. So in this case, I want this to be a little heading section. So I'm gonna right click and say heading. These are also, um, if I hit control, one, two, three, four, control, five, six, all of these things, I can I can change the style whenever I want. So uh, once you're familiar with it, look up the hotkeys, it's a lot faster. And then control J for that again. So now if I'm starting to build out a story here. Um, in fact, that let's see long ago was supposed to be another one. So that's two lines. Just kind of style that out however you want. And then I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. I'm going to grab some more content. You can have, uh, let's see, mode of travel as a section. Let's drop that in. I'm just kind of borrowing from this. So control two is what gets that. That is going to be control J. And you can do things like, say, player's handbook. I can hover over that, and I can do control I, or I can do control B, do both. So you can kind of style this out kind of like a like an RTF type thing. Control 2 here again. J. And then highlight that, control I. All right, so you can just kind of keep doing this as much as you want and then you're making a single story entry so um what you can't do quite yet is you can't quite have um you can't have like sub sub um what am i call it uh breakouts or something like sidebars and that sort of stuff all right so um i'm gonna you can fill out the rest of that stuff i won't delve into that too much we're going to focus a little bit on how you can do, let's do some random encounters. So the other thing you can do is I can add a second one. Let's say I don't want everything in one big long story. You can if you want. So I can say uh, random chapter three, random encounters. All right, so now let's drop in here and some text. And now I'm gonna do a table 
And so we're going to do paragraph types. Do, 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 tables. And then I can right click and do table commands. I can say uh, decrease column scan, add cell. So now I've got two different cells. And I could say, okay, so here's the D20. And here's the type of an author. And then let's see, a 1 to 13. I don't do this a whole lot actually, so bear with me. So let's see, table commands, and cell, there we go. There's a, there's a shortcut for add cell. Um, that's why you want to look and see what that is, because that makes it laugh. I don't want to do that. I want to remove that cell. Table commands, decrease. Oh. I messed it up already, but you basically go through, you can fill this out. Do I do recommend looking at the uh, shortcuts for that, the hotkeys, because when you do tables, they can get a little bit clunky. What I would do probably instead of this, to be honest, is I would actually build a table within Fantasy Grounds and then link it. So let's do that real quick. So let's do dun, 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 tables. So I'm going to go to settings. I don't think I have tables set up here. Oh, I do have tables. There we go. So click on tables. And I'm going to make a new category to so add category and I'm going to call it see my category added down here just as group one. So I'm going to modify that and call it. Um, what do we call this? Uh, Gen Con. Demo. So Gen Con demo. Select that. Now I'm going to add a new table. Add table by size one. Two, three, four. So, going to be four rows. Boom. And all right. So, basically, here I can say this is going to be chapter three random encounters. And then I can paste in that other stuff here. And then here I can say, okay, so um, 1 to 13 is going to be counter. The label is going to be type of counter. This is a lot easier than what I was trying to do earlier because now I can just modify it. It does sort it for you automatically. So sometimes uh, a little pro tip is to start from the bottom and work your way up as a little bit faster. Uh, so let's just drop that in. Again, it's going to automatically have, if you're copying and pasting from someplace, it's going to automatically line, add a line break after each one. So here it is 18, 20. Boom. And then this one is 16 to 17. All right, so now I have this. Where do you want it to output? Do you want it to output to chat, to a story text, to parcel, whatever, encounter? So for here, chat's fine. Do you want it to be visible, show the results? Probably not. This is something that I want to see just as a DM. So that way, if I roll it, you'll see it. It says, oh, I got no encounter. So that's something you can do for random encounters. And then basically what I could do is I could then uh, link this by dragging it and dropping it here. So now I've got a link to that. So I'll close this down, I'll close this down. And now if I want random encounters to be a story element linked here, I'll just drop it in. So you can basically link anything. So see, I close this down. So now when I'm running my encounter, I just go down, or I just go through, I read this, all this stuff, and then I click, boom. And now I've got a link to here, I roll for it. And I say, oh, I've got no encounter again. So every four hours you would, you would run that. All right, so that's kind of um, how you would do some tables. Let's see if I can find some box text anywhere. I'm scrolling through. Okay, cool. So I found some box text. So let's do some box text. So let's close that one. Let's make a new story one. Boom. Let's call it uh, today's catch. 
they are in the little Kuatoa area of Out of the Abyss is where I'm pulling this one from. So again, I'm gonna drop some text in. I think. And this uh, is something where you can really kind of change it. It says it has a, a party of eight Kuatoa led by a Kuatoa monitor. So party of eight Kuatoa led by a Kuatoa monitor. So to me, that would indicate that we're going to have a chance to have a um, encounter here. And here's some more stuff going on. Let's see. Wink. Doctor that up, doctor this up. All right. And now there's box text. So this is the box text that they would see. I don't need the pair, I don't need the quote. Oops, sorry. Wink, wink. All right, so because this is a quote, I don't really need that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click, say paragraph type, chat frame. So now what happens is as I'm making this story and I'm reading it, if, I'm, if it's locked, let's come through and I can click on that and it drops it into the chat window for me automatically. I don't have to do anything else. In this particular case, this is something that somebody is speaking out loud. So if I read through here, uh, this guy, ploop, 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 peen, attempts to communicate under comment. So you could basically select it. Since he's telling his name right away, you can right click and you can say assign a speaker. And the speaker's name, since he's revealing it right away, is ploop, ploop, peen. Now, if I click it, you'll see this is being said by this character and it's ploop, ploop, peen. If I wanted to have, um, let's go down here, see uh, NPCs. This is my own addition that's not in the thing. So basically I wanna make an NPC called Ploop Ploop Peen. Then I would come through here. Again, I'd probably add a group. I'll just do it uncategorized for now. And I will make Ploop Ploop Clean. Uh, wobbly green so the ID versus non ID is when you don't know what they are it'll show up instead of showing what kind of character he is or his name it will just say you know this basically if they click on it um, size you just kind of fill out all the stuff medium type whatever blah 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 um, I don't even have to fill it out yet I can always add that later and then also you have this um, NPC token icon. So if I go to my assets, if I have a lot of tokens, let's see if I have a Kuatoa. Uh, I do have a Kuatoa. I don't know if that's what it looks like, but I'll drop it in there. All right, so now I can take this little dude and I can drop him down here. Control one. So you see how when I was in there, it's, it's expecting I'm going to make lots of links. So if I hit enter, it has an empty spot for it. That means I can drag a link to here and it would, it would link it for me automatically. If I don't want that, I can just right click and change the paragraph type back to body text. And I'm off and going. The other thing is there's an encounter. So I might add that in there. Or, you know, you don't have to put headings for everything if you don't want. Lay it out however you would like. Um, but this could be you know, a Kuatoa patrol. So we're going to kind of jump ahead to NPCs here, counters. Change my group to uncategorized so I don't see all the other stuff that I have loaded. And we're going to call this uh, to a patrol. Now I'm going to fill this in. So maybe this little dude that I just created, maybe he's in there. He's one of the guys that you might meet. And we're going to go to NPC. Since I have the monster manual, I should be able to go back to all and say, okay, let's see. I've got a monitor and some Kuatoa. And there were, what did it say there were? Eight of those guys and one monitor. All right, so now it's all set. Do I want them to be 
What faction are they in? Are they friendly? Are they neutral? Are they hostile? So let's make them let's make them hostile. Let's make them neutral for now because they might they might be okay. And then depending on the actions of the player, they might change it. Maybe I have seven of these because this guy is one of those. If I want Ploop Ploopine to actually be a Kuatoa instead of like this little guy that I made that doesn't have any stats, then I could just get rid of this guy here. And let's go to NPCs. What I would recommend you do is you pop open a Kuatoa. And we're going to go back to our new section. And I'm going to drag him in here. And you'll see here that it says read only. That's because it comes from the monster manual or one of the other books. And it's not something that they expect for you to edit. So I can't really click it and open it and edit it. This one I did want to edit though. So I'm going to actually open that up and I can go here and now I can edit this one. And I can say this is poop. Poop poop clean. I think it was his name. All right, cool. Again, you can add the non ID name and lock it back when I'm done. He's all set. If I wanted to change any stats, like let's say he's got different armor on, instead of natural armor and a shield, maybe he's wearing leather armor, something different about him. I could just say leather armor and a shield. Maybe he's got a 14. I don't know. Something like that. So you can kind of modify these things, give him a better perception, change his stats, any of these things you want to do. Now that I've made a difference, uh, if I wanted to add a new, let's say I have spell casting, I could add spell casting in here, and then he'll have you know some spells that he knows. Um, that's actually let's see if I can find some spell casting. Cool. All right, so I do have some spell casting. I just got to modify it a little bit. Let's add something here. I'm gonna call it innate. Spell casting. This is very particular. It has to actually be called innate spell casting for this to work, or it has to be just be called spell casting. Paste this in here and I think that's what it is. I'm probably going to butcher this, but all right. So it's not a where at, it is Kuatoba. And then just get rid of the extra spaces. Um, I think it can have those there. That's fine. One per day. I will. Yeah. All right. So now I uh, will lock him. There's this new version. One of them is this one, which is garbage. And one of them is this one, which is good. So let's get rid of the garbage one. Delete him. Look at this guy. And now if I scroll through, he has innate spells. So what it basically did is it went and it looked up these, these spells and it found matches for them within like the player's handbook and the other books that I have, and it just loaded it into the character for me automatically, um, which is quite cool. Very good time saver. You could also drag and drop these items, these spells, into the sheet and then use that, but this I find this to be a lot easier. Other, I can modify these things too. Uh, this is the same as what I'm doing right now with the story text. If I unlock this, I could just say, you know, uh, boop, boop, thing loves to talk. And I could say, you know, common things that he might say. Um, are you today? Is your mother? Well, you know, whatever. I could make that a little chat box. And that could be something that he would say, you know, and then you could load up a bunch of things that he might say. And then that way, when you're playing this character, you've got a preset. You just hit the little button there. You would add a speaker for it. So again, uh, not, not paragraph type. You would say assign a speaker. There you go. So that could be something he would say a lot. Okay, so again, I've got this in there now. Let's get rid of this one. Delete this guy. And we're going to use the newer version. Much better. Much cooler. Um, here are the CR and the XP. We'll calculate automatically based off of what's in the encounter. 
And now I can drag and drop this encounter down here and I've got an encounter. So I've kind of pre-set up all of that. We'll show you later on when you can actually start off, like if you have a map where you're going to have the encounter take place, you can preload where all of the different NPCs are gonna be found. All right, cool. Just checking to see if there's any chat here. Um, yeah, so Loco Tomo said, can the bubble speak different languages like in Elvish? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So let's pull this guy up. So this thing here, he's actually speaking, uh, is it under comment? Well, let's see, deep speech. Then you could do that and it should drop it out. There you go. So again, only people that know that language will automatically see it. All right, so let's see. Headings, lists, links, tables. I think all that stuff's in there. Um, bullet list are there. So let's say you can do bullet list. Um, they like collect these things. Fish, shells, burritos. Burritos. All right, so you can highlight all these things and you can change the paragraph type to list. Cells and burritos. So you've got a little bit of styling options here. Once we come out with the reference manual builder, once it's built in, you'll be able to just do all the same sort of stuff you can do here, but you'll be able to do it and you'll uh, be able to add frames and sidebars and graphics and stuff like in line with it. For now, if I wanted to have an image, let's say I wanted to have um, Go to image here, let's see, Kuatoa. All right, so I've got some images of a Kuatoa. So if I wanted to have a picture, like let's say this is what the arc picture looks like, I can open it up and I can say, okay, I want to create an image record of this guy. And now I can link it here. Link to there. So again, now, Pop it open. Um, I would also block it. Okay. And that's how you would do maps and stuff too. Uh, you can see here, this is actually a, an image that's linked to the Dungeon of the Mad Mage is where that's pulled from. So it actually put that name in there. You can get rid of that if you want. You can just say Kuatoa. But that means that I have to have that library module open. If I don't have that module open, then it won't, won't work. Actually, I take that back. It'll still work because I own it and I can use any asset for images now. That's a modification we did with Fancy Grounds Unity. All right, uh, let's see. Next up, uh, so I see I've got a demo, load some modules, create a story text, I did that. Link stories together. Um, so when I mentioned about doing an outline, that's one of the things I do recommend. If you're going to do a lot of, like you're doing a full campaign, one of the very first things I would recommend you do is go to your story, go through, um, make a grouping for it. So right now we have it under this all or uncategorized group. First thing I would do is click add category. It makes group one. Use the list edit tool. This is a little clunky. I do apologize. It's kind of weird. So let's call this um, chapter three. If I'm doing it just for myself, I'm not worried about other stuff going on. If I'm going to sell it, then I probably want to put some prefixes in here, like a little abbreviation of what my campaign is. And I'll use, I'll use a little bit different styling to make it so that it'll sort alphabetically and it'll look good alongside other content. But for now, I'm just going to leave it like that. Leave this drop down open and then I can basically move all of these into here. And you see, as I do that, the column says where it comes from. It's going to show off onto the side. So now I'm on chapter three, it only has that content. And then I would come into here and I would say um, chapter or like, sorry, story outline. And I could be like, oh, chapter one, chat, sorry. Let's make this a link list, paragraph type, link, chapter one, chapter two. Dark. Like chapter four, um, I don't know, village, 
oh, you know, whatever you want it to be. And then basically then you could just link each chapter would have its own outline and then you just drag them over. And as you fill it in, so you kind of leave yourself room. What all do I want to include here? Um, maybe you want an introduction or something like that. Just kind of build it out that way. And then you can kind of fill in the gaps as you go. See, I don't have to have any of these things yet. I can close this window down and hold it. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to close that window down, but I can come back to it and I can just add this stuff later. Um, let's see, what else can we do here? The placeholder for other elements, uh, NPCs. Yeah, so if you want to make NPCs, if you have the SRD, let's look at NPCs for a second. So I actually have the SRD loaded and I have the monster manual loaded, the official one. So this is my uncategorized stuff. I'm going to look at all. You'll see as I kind of expand this out, I've got an Aarakocra, I've got an Aboleth. There's two Aboleths. Excuse me, there's one from the Monster Manual and there's one from the SRD Bestiary. Uh, I've got Morden Canaan's Tomes, got some stuff. Uh, if I only want to see stuff from there, I can click on that. And now it's the same as selecting this group drop down, just two different ways to kind of do that. So I can see only the other items that are in here. All of these I can use and they're all filled out, ready to go. Uh, let's go back to all. I'm going to show the difference between Aboleth and the Bestiary. Keep this on the left and an Aboleth from the monster manual. They're actually pretty similar. See, the big difference here is that there's an icon that says A because it doesn't have the graphics. So whenever you fight this creature, you're going to have a large size A to battle against unless you apply your supply your own graphics. Um, if you have the monster manual, then it comes with like a little token pog for it automatically, which will look like an Aboleth on the map. Um, both of those will resize automatically to a large size. They'll fit up a two by two square, but you'll see the stats are the same across the board. So you could actually use the SRD and, and be fine. And then let's see, mucus cloud, mucus cloud. It should be across the board should be same. Um, and then other things like, for instance, you'll see as I'm hovering over things, certain keywords are being picked up automatically. So whenever you're making your own NPCs, you just have to use the same format. So if you if you use this where it says it takes six 1d12 acid damage, then basically the way that Dungeons and Dragons does it, the, the standard that they've established is that they put the average roll, which I guess should be kind of seven there. Um, or no, I guess it would be six. All right, it is 1d12, not 2d6. Sorry, it's early in the morning. I've only had one cup of coffee. Bear with me. And then it says, how, what kind of damage does acid damage? Like it would say, if you wanted to make that slashing damage or something like that, you just basically change out the keywords and it'll look for keywords like slashing, piercing, bludgeoning, acid, fire, cold, um, all of those sorts of things, lightning damage. Those things mean something to the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition rule set within Fantasy Grounds. So if I move this over to the side, if I hover over it, if I drag it through here, it will roll a 1d12 and it makes that's nine acid damage if i drag that to somebody it will it will apply acid damage and then if they happen to have resistance to acid or vulnerability to acid it'll apply the modifiers there and either increase the damage or decrease the damage by half or double it so um, it does all that for you when you're making your own characters you really just need to type it in exactly like it is in the book you could get rid of all this other stuff the other text if you didn't really care about it and all you really wanted was like the hits and stuff like that then just make sure you put the the keyword like hit colon and then make sure that you you know put that stuff in there if it if it's a dc 14 constitution saving throw if you just need those things you could do that you know just load it in however you would like um, let's see, here's a melee weapon attack. So melee weapon attack has to be spelled out like melee weapon attack colon. If it's a ranged weapon attack, obviously you would just change the keyword in the beginning. So the best thing you can do is look at the SRD for monsters that are similar to the monster that you want to create, and then just modify those or use the same format. Reach 10, that just, you know, explains how far away it is. We don't apply that currently in the system, uh, but that would be something you'd want to make sure that you match up and then the damage once you actually hit. So it looks for the attack and looks for the hit. So if I do the attack, it'll roll it with the plus nine. And let's see, options, let's see if there's anything else here. 
No, that's not. And then other, this is just your description. So let's see the difference is, now you start to see a little bit more of the difference. This is the Abla from the Monster Manual. This is the Abla from the SRD. So it doesn't really tell you like, okay, if you've never played Dungeons and Dragons before and you don't know what an Ablith is, you might be a little bit lost and you might role play it in a really weird, strange way for people that maybe have played Ablis before. That's fine. Maybe your Ablis and your world are different than everybody else's, which could throw your players, you know, for a loop. Um, here, you've got things like the image. You could share that with the players. And you've got a list of, you know, what its layer is like and other stuff. So just the content from the book is going to be there. All right, so um, you can do some searches here. So once you build up a library of content, you can say, okay, well, I really need a CR3 creature. Just kind of narrow it down. Now you've got a list of all the different CR3 creatures that would challenge your party. Um, you know, if you want a certain type, okay, I only really want a, let's see if I have any CR3 aberrations. Okay, I've only got a few of those. A Niyogi would be a fantastic one. If you've never played Spelljammer, Niyogis are awesome. This little dude here. Ah, oh, man. It's a little spider overlord slavers. The best enemies in the world. You don't want to get caught by these guys. Um, little, side, little side quest thing, too. The, the great old ones uh, get so bloated and fat that the other, the other guys eventually decide that they want to take them over, and they all go and bite it and poison it. And then, uh, and then it hatches out, and then they lay eggs in it, I think. So it's like in a paralyzed stupor, and then all the eggs hatch out and then eat it from the inside out. That is nasty, nasty creatures. Great stuff for the players to defeat. All right, so um, let's see. I'm just checking chat to make sure there's no questions coming in then. Nope, looks pretty good. All right, cool. So um, other things you can do is you can look by CR here. There's little links once you fill in more and more content. So again, I've got these little collapsible sections. I can kind of just scan through and see, or I can say I can shrink down and say, okay, I want a CR. Let's see what my CR 30 options are. Oh, look at that, a Tarask. And you notice I've got two different options here. That's because I have the SRD and the other one. So you will see duplication if you have both, both of them. I recommend if you're going to be building your campaign, you decide early on, do I want to build my stuff off of the SRD or do I want to build it off of official content? That way you don't have duplication and you don't accidentally grab SRD stuff when you could have used the monster manual stuff. Um, when you have both, you're only ever going to want to use monster manual. But I will say, let me go to my library modules. I mentioned this earlier on in the thing. If you look for, say, Cobalt Press, or AAW Games has got a lot of great stuff too. They have a creature codex with lots of great creatures. So even if you're running a stock D&D game, you could probably borrow a creature or two and throw it in there or just steal ideas from them. They got some great, great stuff though. So they got that. Let's see, the Tome of Beast I think is good too. Southland, that's if you're playing a different kind of campaign um, in their campaign world. Tome of Beasts and Tome Based 2. Give me lots and lots of extra, extra monsters that I could use. I won't load all these up. This will take too long to load them all up. That's again, doing it in the middle of a campaign. Actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and load that. Doing this in the middle of a campaign is going to make, you know, Fantasy Grounds is going to sit and think for a little while as it's loading all these things up. So typically, again, go back to your sources, decide what sources you want to have active, and then get them there. And then if you add a new book in between, you know, session four and session five, just load it before the players join the game. Uh, Banach says that the SRD is important for releasing stuff that's not covered by the DMs Guild. That is correct. If you are building your event, if you're going to build an adventure module and you wanted to, you know, share it with other people, then, then you probably don't want to use the monster manual. You probably want to use the SRD. But if you just link to the monster manual and I, I used a monster from that, then it won't actually duplicate the content. And then if you were to share that, someone else who opened up that module would get a note saying, Hey, you need the monster manual. So, doesn't really copy the data. All right, so that's loaded. 
I'm just going to very quickly show you guys some of the, the Toma B stuff. So let's see, NPCs. Just because I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I don't want CR3. I want all CRs. I don't want just aberrations. So nine pages of extra monsters that that added in here. Uh, let's see. Thank you. Yeah. So this is great. If you're going to build your own NPCs, I love what they did here where they basically, they've got the description, but one of the first things that they did, this is super, super helpful as a DM if you're going to run a game, is in addition to showing that, like you could just share, share the description. So this is the you know, description of what it looks like. Super awesome. Home of Beasts, very good. Oh, the Tomb of Beast. Yeah, that's the running joke is that um, I think David calls him the Tomb of Beast a lot. Um, I don't know if David's in or not. Yep. Um, I'm going to do a real quick. Let's see what time is it right now. It's 10.11. I'm going to take a really quick bio break. Uh, everybody, if you want to go grab fresh coffee or drink or something like that, we're going to take a quick maybe 10-minute break, and then we will come right back. All right, I got back a little bit sooner than I thought, so. Oh. We'll give a few, moment, few more moments for those who um, are still kind of filtering out. So how many of you guys are all on, uh, guys and gals are out at Gen Con right now? 
I think there's a decent amount of people, uh, mostly on YouTube and Twitch. Got a few folks chiming in from Facebook. Oh, congratulations, good Kirk. Good Kirk. You have a daughter coming in two weeks. Great. Daughters are amazing. Is that your first? Second grandbaby. Oh, wow. Cool. We'll just raise her right and have her playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs. Ah. Give another couple minutes here. Yeah, we did Gen Con for a while. The very first time I ever went to Gen Con was in 2010, I think. Yeah, right after I had purchased the company. And we started, we did a booth because they had done a booth in previous years. So I went out and, you know, purchased one of those little expandable booth things that uh, was pretty cool to set up. And I just drove it all up in a truck and unloaded and set it all up myself pretty much. Um, my wife helped me. It was quite fun. It was neat seeing, especially from behind the scenes, seeing all the other booths go up was pretty epic. Oh, thanks, Rob. Rob Heaton on YouTube said, both my sons and my wife play D&D, and we use FG FGU. I have about nine people I game for, and we love FGU. Thanks for the vids. No, thank you. We'd love to hear that. Cool. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started again and jump right in. Let's see. All right, so one of the things that um, you want to do with a campaign, I'm covering a lot of the stories and the outlines and, and filling it up with monsters and items, all that sort of stuff, which we'll continue to do some more of that. But one of the most important things, obviously, uh, as we've just you know mentioned on chat here, was that the players, there's going to be players in there. So let's say that your players have created their characters in their own version, in their own campaign, uh, and you want to load them into the campaign. So the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to go into the character section. And you could just leave it up, and then they could, when they join your game, they'll do the character wizard, or they'll you know, add the item and fill out the character sheet. If they've already done that, they can export it, and then they send you the XML file. So if they've done that, you come in here, you do your import character, and here's some different characters that I could import. Um, so I will import this Barbara the Barbarian, or you could import it from a file. So if, if you have a file somewhere, you could do that. This would be from my other kind of campaigns that I want to do. If I want to bring someone from one campaign to another campaign, I could bring those over that way. But if you don't, if they just send you a file, you'll hit this. And unfortunately, it doesn't show up, but there's a, there's a file dialog that popped up, and then I'm just going to select... Uh, which one I want. So I'm going to select uh, Barbara the Barbarian, and now she would show up. So if I go to Characters, now I have Barbara the Barbarian, uh, Barbara the Barbarian, and Barbara just needs an image. So if I look at this, so it has all of the stats already pre-filled out. So 
with everything that she needs explain reckless attack and blah 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 um, i'm also going to go ahead and import a few more so let's import got some oh yeah new gal new gal the gnome add her and this one yeah so you'll have a handful of characters that's probably enough to get started All right, and we're going to add a portrait. So to add a portrait, they'll just click through here and they'll select. These are all the files that I have loaded. So if I want to grab someone from Baldur's Gate, for instance, um, I could do that. Or I could go to the assets and just go to portraits. So they will have to send you the portrait file that they want to use if they have a custom image and you have to load it in. Um, or they can have it on their system and then use it and then go that route. So they would normally set this themselves. They'll add their own portrait. Let's say, what is, uh, so there's a barbarian lady, Amiri. This, she looks very barbarian. Oh, actually, she looks very barbarian like. All right, cool. So now I've got her all set. So you would do that for your other characters. Since I imported these from campaigns, they brought in with the image automatically. If I load it from XML, I just have to assign it. And then once you have your characters selected, um, you're going to want to put them into a couple places. So the combat tracker is where you track initiatives. So I like to have everybody in the combat tracker there. The other thing that's important about the combat tracker is if they're going to use any of their special abilities that are effects, they need to have the they need to be loaded in the combat tracker. So if I open up that character sheet, you see that Barbara has used some of our advanced uh, effects to create rage and reckless attack. So when she turns on her rage and her reckless attack, it's going to basically add it in here and uh, that's going to last for one minute. That's going to la last for the next attack. So if, if she's not in the combat tracker, then what you're going to see is you're going to see a note saying, hey, they're not in the combat tracker, I can't do it. So then you just add them into the combat tracker and then they reapply it. So add them into the combat tracker. The other place you're going to want to add, uh, and this is where they would add any other effects that they have, like long effects, if mage armor, that sort of stuff, they can manage themselves. The players are going to manage that on their own. Um, the other place you're going to put them into is the party sheet. Party sheet is a DM's best friend as far as um, keeping track of how everyone's doing in the party. So let me just show you what that looks like here. I'll just drag and drop them in from the characters window. And here I see their current hit points. So at a glance, I can see, okay, uh, I see if new gal's almost dead and I've got a big deadly encounter coming up, maybe I kind of like we'll share some warning signs first. Like, hey, you hear you know, uh, a lot of heavy footsteps coming this way and you hear guttural sounds and, and, and uh, bickering in Orcish coming from around the corner. And if they're really wounded, maybe New Gal then says, you know, maybe we should hide this time, you know, and then you can maybe head off a TPK before it gets too far. Or, you know, maybe, maybe you can sprinkle in some extra stuff that they find. Oh, you happen to find a stash of, uh, potions sitting in a bag up against a tree on the side of the road and inside there's some you know cure light wounds potions or something like that that they can maybe use to help get themselves back on their feet before they continue on or maybe you just suggest you know you're feeling kind of tired and beat down you might want to you know set aside some some rest the other things that you have here again i'm not going to get into how to use fantasy grounds and how to use all the various features of it but you could do things like, okay, I want to do a perception check. If you don't want to use passive perception, which you could see there's AC and perception, you could just scan those and you could do a, a hide check for the enemies. But it, let's say you like to actually roll it and you said, okay, well, I rolled an 18. Let's see if anyone, they said that they were looking for, you know, a bad guy or something like that. You could say, I want to hide those results and just roll it. So then as a DM, you can very quickly see, okay, did anybody, nope, everybody failed. So they failed to see the uh, little gnome that's sneaking up on them, <clears throat> for instance. Same thing, if you're gonna attack the party, you could do an attack string, same thing. Uh, you know, crossbow bolts shoot out from the wall, 
in the in the dungeon that they've walked through or something like that. Um, saving throw, same same deal. And then whether or not you want it to be revealed to the party. Under the inventory tab, this is helpful because you see a list of what everybody has. So your party inventory, it just pulls from all of their character sheets and I can see, okay, well, maybe whoever has the drum is gonna get targeted with something. You know, okay, oh, Barbara has a drum. So maybe she's the one that I'm gonna target. Or maybe they've given a, a secret cursed contract that a devil's gonna come look at. I can also, as a DM, I can just open up and look at any of the characters. So I can kind of scan them and see what kind of stuff they have. I can, um, you know, make sure that the math checks out. Okay, why do they have a 27 strength? I have no idea, you know, and then you can modify those. The players can put pretty much anything that they want, it's kind of like uh, pen and paper. You know, they could write some garbage stuff on their sheet if they really wanted to, and then you can kind of go through and look at it. So again, I've got a very quick, I don't have to open up every character sheet. I can just scan them and I can be like, okay, everything looks kind of normal, but all right, uh, James has got a 19 charisma. Is that legit? I don't know. Maybe you might d delve into that a little bit more. Uh, who has dark vision? Dark vision is going to automatically be applied whenever you're using light line of sight. Uh, let's see. Squee Goblin Nabob says, do imported XML characters run into issues if they were made with elements from modules you don't have? Or homebrew? Or does it carry over items, feats, spells, etc. within the character? I imagine items lose images, but hopefully still function. Uh, that is correct. So if you don't own it, you will get a note. So like, let's say, for instance, um, New Gal. So New Gal created her character offline, and then I imported it in. So you would see all of the, like the skills will all be fine. The abilities might have some abilities linked to things in a book that I don't own. So if I was to click on discovery, if I didn't own that book, it would prompt me and say, hey, you don't own this resource. So I wouldn't be able to see the details of it, but Barbara would, or I bet the player for New Gal would if they have that module loaded. That's basically how that kind of works. So again, these detail, all of these stats and stuff like that should just work, even if they have a class. So again, it'll still say, you know, Supreme Wizard, if that was from a book that, that she owned that I didn't own, would say, oh, Supreme Wizard level five. I could still see that, but if I click on the link, I'm not gonna, able, not gonna be able to open that or show the image for it, because it's from a book that I don't own. So I won't be able to see any of that stuff. Uh, so I got a question. Are you going to go through the effects and personalized effects? Only, uh, I went through that quite a bit in the campaign, uh, not the campaign, the character creation video that I did yesterday. So I would recommend go back and check it, take a look at that because, um, there's a lot of actions and effects there that you can do. So this one is just like some spell. These are built in, but like when I did Barbara, for instance, I went through and just added these. There's a wiki that has a lot of these. There's, um, Zach uh, Zacharias has a, a bunch of classes built out with all of this sort of stuff you can drag and drop. There's also some stuff in the Forge and on DMs Guild from a couple different folks that have put together entire collections of effects you can drag and drop. Uh, but we kind of walk through the basic elements of how to do effects here. And that's under the character creation guide video. So go check that out. Um, and then, you know, Go to the forums if you have any questions on that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, uh, so Binox says, same thing happens if you don't have the sources open. So yeah, if I was to, if I was to use something from a book and I, and I don't have it open, it'll prompt me, hey, do you want to load this? If I own it, it'll just load it for me. And Bella just posted a link uh, to the videos for YouTube, so you can kind of go and look and see the ones from yesterday. I spent a fair amount of time kind of covering effects, so uh, that's a you you could spend as much time as you want almost on that topic. All right, so yeah, we're on inventory here. So inventory is interesting because um, when you have treasure, so like let's say for instance, let's go back to my story text here, uh, the day's catch. So this is like an encounter, right? So right after the encounter, one thing I like to do is treasure, and let's make a treasure parcel. So let's do parcels. Um, and then here I can add a new treasure parcel. So I'm gonna close some other windows down. It gets a little bit 
Inky here. All right, so this is my new treasure parcel I'm doing. So it's going to be uh, base catch. So maybe I've got, I don't know, um, 11 pieces of gold and 34 silver pieces and two copper, right? So that is a treasure parcel all by itself. If I want to add items, I could just add and say fish, three fish, and two fancy shells. And then I can go to items and I can look for, yeah, maybe there's a vial of acid here. And let's see. Maybe they also happen to have a sword. And there was a long sword. Well, cool. maybe a potion. Potion of poison. All right, so I've got all of these things here. This is in the treasure parcel. And then you could lock it when you're done, basically. And what you could do is you could drag this in to there. So now the day's catch, I've got this. So, so after they've maybe defeated this encounter, or maybe the, the thief just saw that they had this stuff and stole it or whatever, they'll open it up. They've got that there. Then on the party sheet, which I mentioned earlier, you have um, treasure. So I can drop this in. Now you'll see that the gold added to whatever other party gold that I had. And then here the items kind of showed up on the side. And I can drag and drop these. And who wants the fish? And who wants the longsword? Who wants all of these things? I could type in all the different players that I have in the game. So Barbara or James or whatever. So if I start typing James, so see it, it pre-fills it. I say, okay, that's going to go to James. And Barbara is going to get this thing. And the other ones are going to just stay in here. And um, I'll just hit... This little button down here it says distribute assignment and coins and you'll see this is the goal that they already have but if i click this button it's going to do the math for me and you see there's four people in my party sheet right so sorry there are four people in the party sheet so it divided all those coins up among four people evenly but it can't divide three coins across four people so it just left it in the party sheet for now as i add more coins later on then the extras will be over. So this is kind of like, oh, and these are the coins that we couldn't divide evenly. Obviously, you can't divide two into four or three into whatever. You could swap those out and say, okay, I'll give you a gold and you give me the silver. And I mean, you could work it out that way. It doesn't do that, but it tells everybody what their character sheets were updated with. Yeah. Yeah, Banak asked, what kind of fish do I have in Florida for them to have acid and sword? Yeah, I got a lot of... We have crazy fish here. They're swordfish. You know, there are swordfish. So, you know. Uh, let's see. The other thing you can do, what is a fish worth? And, and this particular out of the abyss, maybe fish are, maybe it's a heavy fish. It's, it's, it's a, let's see, 15 pound fish. This is not a, this is not a lightweight fish. So its cost is 12 gold for that fish. Big blue fish with a sword nose. All right. And then you could specify the rest of the stuff. You can just fill out whatever you want, basically. Is it ID'd or not ID'd? All right. So now the other thing you can do is you see this little 50%? That 50% is how much you're going to sell this for. So this each one of those should be worth 12 gold. So if I was to sell these things, then anything that had a value, acid is worth 18, or the fish at 50%. Is 36 gold for 12 and then half of that because it's 50 percent is 18 gold it got translated into acid vial was evidently worth 12 gold so i've now sold those at the shop i want it if they did a really good job bartering maybe i give them 60 percent or 70 percent or whatever and now i can distribute that gold and you're there so and if i was to look at james james should now have a long sword an extra long sword in his in his uh inventory yep and he's, he's now equipping it. So he probably wants to just be carried. I don't know if he wants to equip it. Maybe. I don't know. So that's the party sheet. 
and party inventory. So you don't have to worry about you know who's going to keep track of it, who's keeping all the notes. Fantasy Grounds does all that for you. All you do is drag and drop the items into the into the list here. And you can keep adding stuff. So that was one one treasure, but there's other treasures, you know. The other thing you can do is tables. If I look at some tables here, you can get really, really fancy with tables and loot. So if you have the Dungeon Master's Guide, I'm just going to say all here. You'll see the Dungeon Master's Guide under Chapter 7 has got loads and loads and loads of treasure. So if you want to say, okay, well, I want to get a random 100 gold piece gemstone, and I want to include that in my treasure, then you could say, okay, well, I want to drop it to chat. You could roll that. And it says, oh, it's going to be this one. Um, Crystal Barrel. I probably didn't pronounce that right. But there you go, 100 gold. Now you could drag and drop that into a, into a treasure or into the party sheet or whatever. Um, or you could do something where it goes right into, <clears throat> excuse me, into instead of chat, you could have it drop into a story or a parcel is probably what you'd want to do, or an encounter, encounter doesn't matter. But so I'm going to do a hoard. Treasure hoard is the keyword that they used. And so if I look at this, you'll see that there's coins or the full thing. So if I look at coins for challenge uh, 11 to 16, you see this kind of thing here, uh, where it's going to just roll the gold and the platinum. And you see it uses keywords, 46 times 1,000 gold, that's in brackets. So look at our wiki to see like all the different options that are available. And then um, you could roll on that. If I look at a challenge, let's grab a big challenge 17. So this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. As you see, it's going to roll on all of these charts and it's going to come up with 3D six times it's going to roll on the 1000 gemstone chart. So that's going to give you potentially like 18 or so different gemstones that are worth a thousand gold each. If they happen to also first roll a three through a five on a D100, it's going to roll that. It's going to roll one day eight times on the magic item table C and then the treasured hoard coins collection 17 so these are all in brackets right so if i was to say well what is in magic item table c magic item table so there's a b c d all these kind of things right so these are directly in the book for the dungeon master's guide that's why the dungeon master's guide is a great resource if you're going to like modify and do your own homebrew so here i've got a list of all of these different potions and these have links so if i if i have a new item that i just created like fish if i wanted to add fish into here i would just drag it into one of these links and then whenever that item gets rolled it it knows which item to link it to so it's not just a strength i'm sorry not just a text description of what's included it's actually the items that you could then hand out to your players or they could sell and then use it right away uh, so that's magic item table c if I wanted to make my own magic item tables, I could just modify those and I could go back to this hoard and I could change it. I don't want magic item tables. See, I want Doug's magic item tables instead. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate. The best way to kind of show this is to demonstrate it. So I'm going to change it from chat to story to parcel. And so I'm going to click uh, roll and you're going to see it's going to roll through a bunch of these things. So first thing is it's going to roll an 11. So now you'll see it start to fill in all this gap. Can you guys hear the dice rolling on that too? I don't know if it comes through the stream at all. All right, so loads and loads of gold, bags of beans, potions of clairvoyance, all that sort of stuff. And the nice thing is I've got this that I could then drop to chat. I could put it in my story. Uh, let's see here. Close that down, close that down. So see the day's catch. So instead of this thing with a few shells and a long sword, I could just drop that in there. Boom, my treasure hoard challenge 17, there you go. And then again, go to the party sheet. And now they got loads and loads of stuff that gets added in. Uh, so Spinster77 says, question, can you embed random numbers of multiple NPCs in the table? For example, table roll result 1 to 3, 1 d 4 goblins, and 1 to 2 uh, hobgoblins. Yeah, you can. So let's let's show that. Let's show random encounter. So this 
this particular case, I had an encounter, which if we look at it, had seven, had uh, seven, and then one monitor and one whatever. So this is a standard encounter. And then if I want to add that to the combat tracker, it adds all of those in. And I'm ready, it rolled initiative and it rolled hit points because I had random hit points set up. So that's all there. So let's make it a random encounter instead. Let's get rid of this. Let's use the same idea. So we'll go to encounters. And you see there's a button that says uh, random. And so random encounters, yeah, I've got a bunch of them already. You can actually look and see, okay, so 1D2 Frost Giants is an example, or um, 1D4 Half Ogre, all that kind of stuff. So I can create my own. Let's go back down to uncategorized, boom. Random Matoa encounter. All right, and so here, I wanna grab, or you said Hobgoblin, sorry. Random Hobgoblin. All right, so now um, I'm going to basically go to NPCs and let's grab a Hobgoblin. Oops, I'm in Toma Beast. Toma Beast does not have any Hobgoblins. Let's go back up to all. All right, so I've got from the Monster Manual and the Best Year. So I'm going to use, oh, and I've got some Bolo's Guide stuff. So let's say there's going to be one Devastator, always one Devastator. And there's going to be four, uh, I don't want that one. That one is the SRD one. It has the letter H. We're gonna have some hobgoblins and maybe maybe some regular goblins too. All right. So example one d six. So let's say what did you say? Uh, one d four, one d two hobgoblins. All right. So one d two hobgoblins. One of those and. Uh, 2d6 gods, right? All right, so now I've got this. And so how this works is counters. Drop that in there. So they would then open this up when they're ready. And they would say, oh, this is what I'm about ready to fight. And let's make them, these guys are definitely hostile. Right? Then to generate, and what it did is it just rolled for me automatically two goblins, two hobgoblins, and a Elven Devastator. Uh, that's one example that it did. I generated again. Now you see it came up with a different number. So it does that for you kind of automatically. Other thing you can do is, and I'm probably going to butcher the um, syntax on it. I don't know if Bell knows automatically on the wiki. Is it actually, uh, I could do this here. Encounters, random. See this little button here, help, and click on that. And that should bring up the help section for encounters, groups, NPCs, random encounters. That's the syntax for random encounters. All right, so let's do, instead of 2d6, I think it is, uh, let's see. PC, four, times four. I don't think that's right. Hold on. Fantasy grounds. Anybody in chat use that recently? You know what they, uh, what the little thing is for it. There's a, basically there is preparing encounter. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Keywords. There's a way you can basically say, I want to have um, one for every PC. Do, 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 do. I see the 2D6, all that sort of stuff. It's PC times four. We'll try that. If it doesn't work, it's no big deal. Boom. Nope, that wasn't, that wasn't the right one. Syntax, syntax, syntax. Might be, might be. I'm going to try to find it in the wiki real quick. So I have to go to the user manual, available rule sets, 
5e NPCs and encounters. Scroll through here. Spellcasting, NPC traits. Creating encounters. Oh, there we go. Dollar sign PC. All right, so two NPCs. X times, all right, so two and an asterisk, two times PC. So I've got four PCs, so that'll make eight. There you go. So do check the wiki. The wiki's very cool. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a general screen share, so um, I don't have that. But basically, what I went to is I went to the help uh, Fantasy Grounds user manual, and then I went to available rule sets, D&D 5e, and then one of the options is 5e NPCs and encounters. And at the very bottom of the page, which is why it took me so long, because it's a long page, there's a whole section on random encounters can use the dollar sign PC to do it. So you could also do, I think you can even combine those. You can do like 1d6 times PC or something like that. So maybe. <laughs> so you can do some crazy, crazy stuff with these combos. And that's nice because if you're going to build a, an encounter and you want to have, like, Savage Worlds does a lot of that. Or they say, oh, you're going to fight fight three three of these for every, you know, PC that you have in your party. And then that way, if you have three or four or five, then, um, you know, it'll automatically scale up or down the encounter for you out of the gate with a random encounter. Pretty helpful. And if you don't like the number you got, you can always just dial it back. You know, you can always unlock that and just say, yeah, that's too much. I don't want to do that. So no big deal. Point. Let's close some windows. The one thing to say is, see, I generated all of these. So it made a lot of extras because I was like trying out the different values. So I don't actually want all those random encounters to show up there. Instead, I want... Uh, the source random counter, which is this one, to show up. All right, so um, boom, 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 boom. let's see what else is going on. Where were we here? All right, so we've done encounters, we've done treasures, did lots of cool stuff with treasures, treasure hordes. Let's look back at my trusty. And here we added players. Oh, so LinkedIn with encounters. Obviously, they defeat the encounter. So let's go ahead and make another random encounter. Let's say they had this random encounter. They defeated it. That's now a CR5 encounter worth 1,700 experience points. Then you go back to that party sheet and you go to the XP tab, drop it in, and now you can say award XP boom it'll go and you'll see it divided did the math for you automatically and gave them all their xp if you have a bunch of stuff let's say they fought four different random encounters right so let's do some more let's do another one doink that was worth two thousand then they did another one it was also cr5 it was only worth that and then another one so they just like to farm this area. They're just camping in this one area and then wiping out the poor hobgoblin patrols, right? So they defeated all of those. You'll see that they show up here. This first one I've already awarded. I could go through and I could right click on those and I could say uh, award XP for each one. And it would just check the box as I went. Or I can just hit award and it does them all for me. So just let it, let Fantasy Grounds manage all your math for you. And then the character sheet just got updated. So go back to... Barbara the Barbarian, now on her uh, tab here, she's got XP 1850, right? And when she's ready to level up, she just says level up, and she'll go through and she'll fill out, you know, do I want to make my Barbarian now as a level three? Oh, now I get to pick my specialization, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So 
I won't do that now, but that's how you can keep track of where they are. And then if they've updated their character sheet with their own XP, where their next level is, then that would reflect here. Quests are similar. So basically a quest, find the missing fish. Oh, I found the fish. So which CR is it? CR2 is worth 500 XP. If the party finds the fish, they win D&D. So then you drop that over. So now you have a list of any running quests that they have. And then once they say, oh, I've located that, then you just go through, same thing, just check it off. Oh, probably don't want to use this award button because they're going to have a running list of things. They will be able to see this. The players will be able to see these kind of things on their system. You awarded it, now you know. This, this is really helpful for like a log, like a running log of what you've, what you've accomplished so far. You can clear it out if you want. Uh, if you've got a bunch of stuff, use the search windows. We've got all the same thing, so that won't help, but you can use the search window if they've got, if it's a long running campaign. The order tab is nice if you want to just say, okay, well, who's on watch? Uh, this person's on watch one, person's on watch two, and these two are both on watch three. So that way, when you're doing your random encounters, you know who's who was on the watch at that point in time, and you could just say, okay, well, I don't want everybody to roll perception. I just want Barbara, since she's actively searching to roll perception. Okay. And then if they're doing marching order, you can basically lay them out. All right, so she's up front. Bob's up front. John Bob's up front. Uh, and James is in the middle. New gal is in the back. That's your marching order. The players will move themselves around on that screen. Um, Big Tigerman says, uh, can you roll back if you change your mind about leveling up or multi-classing? Sort of, but it's, it's somewhat manual. You'll have to basically, um, when you level up, it's not exactly campaign based, but it's, you know, related. It's, it's an ongoing campaign running. So let's say they go through here. Say once they level up, it'll change the level here. It changes their hit dice, that sort of stuff. So you will want to you know, modify these things. The, the other thing that will happen is once you level up, it's going to add abilities and stuff here. So you'll want to go and remove those skills. It'll show up here as well. So you'll have to kind of manually kind of un unravel those things after the fact. A little hard. It's not an easy rollback option. But anything in Fantasy Grounds can be changed. You can change any of the numbers anywhere. So, you know, if they, if they had a level 4 upgrade and they put it in decks instead, you could just come back in and just say, okay, no, I only want a 16. Just like pen and paper, you know. Except they would have, you know, already wrote everything on pencil, so you got to go back and undo it all. All right, so let's say you built out your entire encounter. Uh, let's see, I've got items. Parts. The other thing is images. So I guess I can show you guys some image stuff. And then we can do items. All right, I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm trying to get, get ahead. Lots of things going on 11. I think we got a little bit more time. So I'll do some, I'll do some items. All right, so items. If you have the SRD, you've got all that stuff in there automatically. I showed how you just create a fish kind of on the fly. Some things about items that I want to cover are, let's see, add a new item. So let's expand this out. See, it's pretty basic, right? But um, let's call it armor of whatever. So here, as I type, Armor. Now it's going to kick. Uh, it's going to recognize that and realize, oh, I'm doing armor. So now I need to put in what's my base AC? Six. Oh, is it magical armor? It's plus two. Next bonus. You know all that sort of stuff. So it'll fill out depending on what you selected. If I made a weapon, then you'll see it's going to have damage and properties and stuff. And so typically, again, I want to recommend is look at the types here, and that's what you're going to try to to match up with. 
And if you have the SRD, try to match up with the same sort of stuff. Wondrous items. So I think it's that one. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't have a lot. But yeah, armor and weapons will get picked up. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's also this thing called the forge. Let me show what that is real quick. Let's say you want to have a custom magic item in your system. The Dungeon Master's guys loaded with loads and loads and loads of these. Uh, SRD has a decent amount as well. So you can use that. So what you can do is on the left-hand side, you're going to have base equipment. On the right-hand side, you're going to have templates. Um, and so if I look at my items here, I have this button that says templates. And I had the forge, right? So let's look at templates. And these are all my magic item templates. And you'll see I've got some armor templates and I've got some weapon stuff. So let's look at weapons. So my weapons, I can grab, let's say defender. If I want to make a defender weapon, I would drop the defender in there. And let's say I wanted to add, I'll just stick with defender for now. So let's say do defender and then weapon plus two. So plus two defender is what I'm trying to make, right? What kind of weapon do I want it to make? So I've got my templates here. I got my items here. Let's do, I want a, a rapier of defense. So I'm going to grab my way, my rapier from the player's handbook, drop it in here and then hit forge magic item. Now I have a rapier defender plus five, plus five, or is it plus five? Uh, oh, because defender is already, I bet plus three so see sometimes uh fantasy grounds is smarter than i am so it added those together and it made my rapier for me so now i could add that in wherever i want let's get rid of defender i don't want it to add that extra let's add some different templates so some templates let's look at vicious let's make it vicious and sharp so now I have a vicious rapier, rapier of sharpness plus two and it made it for me. And in addition to having the bonus set up here uh, and the properties now says it's magic, the description has notes and a link on each one of these things. This is from the book on each section about sort of sharpness and what, what that means to be sharp and all that kind of stuff it shows up there. Now there, you might still need to do some modifications on how this actually implements those abilities uh, within your within your sheet. I would recommend looking at the 5e advanced effects for some of those, and you may want to um, use some of those things. Uh, and you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So like, let's say I did a rapier, right? Let's say if I wanted to do a uh, whole suite of items, right? So Let's do, oh, those are templates. So I want a great sword and probably a long sword and maybe a short sword. So a forge magic item and a whole set of them, right? Lots of stuff. So you can forge your own stuff pretty good. You can make your own templates as well. So if you have your own custom templates, you can just kind of come through and create your own stuff. Uh, that was sword stuff. Um, armor. Same thing. So I can clear the forge. And I can say I want to do uh, a poison resistance and plus three armor. Uh, demon armor of poison resistance and then for the items let's make it plate uh, do you want a breastplate or half plate uh, we'll do a half plate all right a half plate armor half plate demon armor of poison resistance plus three is what it should come up with oh Close, demon half plate armor of poison resistance plus four. So one of these already had a plus one built in. Yep. Demon armor already had a plus one. So again, it, it made it a plus four. 
did it, did it for me automatically. So that's the forge. Great fun there. And then you can put those into your treasure charts. You know, and make your own treasure tables, make your own forges, your own, uh, sorry, treasure hoards. Uh, can you show a little on creating, uh, Unliving Luke asks, can you show a little on creating mundane items like meat, bread, cheese, and or even creating services, if that's possible? Yes, yes you can. So, um, let's go to items. Let's make some meat and bread. Just to add item, bread. Is it really sour? No? I don't know. Um, so type would be, I think we call it like, I think that would fall under, that'd be adventuring gear. There probably already is, I'm just curious. There is actually, oh no, that's what I just, <laughs> that's what I just created. So no, there is not. Uh, rations is probably the closest. Let's just look at what rations would be. Yeah, adventuring gear. So type would be adventuring gear. You don't have to put that here. I mean, it could be anything. You could just call it food, you know. Actually, adventuring gear standard is probably what it is. Rarity, common, cost, one silver piece. How much does it weigh? Um, I think this only takes uh, values, integer values, um, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see. Zero point. Uh, maybe not. Zero point one pound. Basic flour and wheat. And I'm all set. So now if I go back, let's see, party sheet. Tori. Now I've got some bread. How much bread? Five portions of bread. All set, ready to go. And then that way it'll just modify it and it will affect your encumbrance, that sort of stuff. If they have it marked as carried. So they have it in their backpack or it's on their mule, whatever, then it won't affect the player. So again, let's grab Barbara. Barbara's inventory. Put some bread on the inventory. She has, it's got 0.1. So let's say her encumbrance is 87.6. If she has four things of bread, now it's 87.9. So it'll keep track of it for, if she doesn't want to carry it, then she could say, I'm leaving it back in the wagon. And then maybe here for the bread, she would say, that, that lets you know where it is on the location. Earlier I said like, when I did the character stuff, um, backpack here, instead of being backpack empty, backpack is a location now that she is carrying a backpack. So let's say she has her clothes in her backpack, costume clothes. She has um, a mess kit and maybe she has a potion in there and her rations are in her backpack. And tinder box is in her backpack. And her water scan is not. So, all right, so now All of those are here. So her backpack is all filled up. So now all of that weight, her weight is 87.5. If she leaves the backpack behind, she saved a lot of weight. So she's not carrying all of that stuff. Squee Goblin to Bob says, nice. Now you have to attune the bread to maximize the satisfaction. Yeah. I think you have to hold the bread for 24 hours, right, in order to attune it. You have to hold it in your mouth the whole time? I'm not so sure. Yeah. And then she comes back to the wagon and rats have ate it. So then she has to go defeat the rats. And then, but then, you know, she's hungry, but now she's level two because she defeated the rats. Hungry adventurers make the best adventurers. All right. So we did items, we did some magic items. Images are big, right? So lots and lots of stuff about images. So here's a nice thing is you can go to, <laughs> yes, you can eat the rats. 
That's right. That's right. You got to think outside the box sometimes. Think like an adventurer. So images, these are all of the things that I have loaded, even for other systems. So like, um, you know, if I wanted to do a sci-fi one, I actually even have, I did Bell says rat kebabs. Rat kebabs don't sound too bad. Ship starter, star battle. So I could even go through and use, um, I could I could use spaceships and just drop that into my campaign. So I have an asset from any other pack. So ship two, let's say if I wanted to use ship two, then this is an asset that I could use. I could set that as my background decal or I could say create an image record. So the very first thing you want to do when you want to use it for your campaign is you have to have it in your assets and there's a there's a link to a folder button here click folder and then just drop the image in there and then hit refresh and then there will be it'll show up in your assets list uh, but let's say or if you have it in another pack like an art pack or it's in another adventure and you want to use it you could just come in load it up say create image record um, i don't care about any of this stuff i'm not doing line of sight here so let's lock that actually let's make it zoom Okay. All right, so I've got this image here. Now I want to use this ship image somewhere. So where's my story? The day's catch. Look up in the sky. There is a spaceship. Boink. There you go. So now I've got a spaceship. Again, this is something that you notice that it said at star battles, whatever. That means it's going to always mean that I have to have that asset in my collection. If I lose that asset, then it won't work anymore. I didn't have to load the asset, though. It just automatically pulled it up for me from my disk. Yeah, that's from a third party person that makes starships and stuff. I just thought it'd be funny to show that you're not really limited on what you can what you can use. Let's go back up to the index. Um, let's say Faerun, right? So let's say I wanted to have some images of Faerun. This is from the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Northern Faerun. This is from the maps. Doink, create an image record. Boom. Drop it in. Now I've got Northern, Northern Faerun. Now this is a map, obviously. No, no surprises there. I'll close my asset windows. So this one is a map. So I open up the map and let's populate the map. So when you're making a campaign, you'll probably have some image of what your campaign world, world looks like. Either you built it yourself or you're using something from an existing source. And then you want to say, okay, well, where's stuff going to happen? So let's say you had a bunch of story things for towns, right? You could have uh, the heartlands. Stuff here random encounters, whatever, all the stuff you want to fill out. And then you just basically drag that link, boink, and drop it onto the map. So I've got the Heartlands. Um, now I want to do uh, Moonshay Isles. Let's do one for that. Moonshay Isles. Add my stuff here and link to other stuff. And then drag that there and just populate the whole map and then what you have is is now you can pop those up whenever you need them right so that's like an overland map you could use okay so the other thing you could do is you could set your distance multiplier and the distance suffix what is it is it feet? This map's not feet. This one's going to be miles. 
That way, if they're moving around on the map, let's say they have a little token for where they are. Say Barbara's on the map. And you want to lock movement. Uh, let's see. Oh, look here. There we go. Hold down Alt. So how many miles? Oh, she went 25 miles. And she went 35 miles. That's 50 miles, whatever. So you can modify that here, distance multiplier to get the right, you know, grid size. Is, is it twice as far? Maybe it's 10. Every every 50 pixels, if you want to see the grid, how, how much distance is that? So look on your little chart down below if there's a scale, which I don't see a scale on this map. And then just set it by how many miles that is. Is it 15 or 20? Let's say it's let's say it's 15. 15 miles for each one of those, right? See how it changes. Then she went to here, then she went to there, or maybe she started from scratch. She went down to here, then over. So as I'm doing this, um, basically, I'm holding down Alt because I'm the DM. So I'm holding down Alt to show my movement, clicking and dragging, and it's calculating the distance for me. And then I just let go. Once I've hold down Alt, I can let go of Alt, and I can drop it. And then now, see, I zoom in, I can hit the check mark, and she'll move from there to there. If I wanted to have multiple segments, I click and drag from here to here, and then here to there, whatever, right? So now I can just make her move along the path there. Or I can say, you know, here you had a random encounter. And then we stop there, and we do whatever is in this location. So that's how you might, you know, manage overland maps. Um, you could also do different grid types if you like uh, hex grids. Same thing. It'll manage it for you. Okay. The players, if it's their token, they can actually do, they can actually do the movement, and then you would have the option with a little check mark to say yes or no. And like, all right, Barbara, no, you can't go that way because there's something happening earlier. So just hit stop. Basically, it's whether or not you want to do token lock. If you don't have token lock, then they just basically they can just move wherever they want to move on the map. And you say, all right, show me where you're going to be. You know, so you could do that if you want. If you want to lock it down where they where it'll do the movement path, you do this token lock, and then they'll start seeing proposed paths where they're going to go. Okay, so that's overland maps. Uh, let's see, time check eleven thirteen. Yeah, I got I got lots of time. So there's um you can you can also borrow maps from other sources such as uh, adventure maps so let's say i know for example i want to do one of my all-time favorites crag mall there's crag mall hideout and crag mall castle so if i look at this so there's a player version and of each of these and then there's a non-player version hideout so let's do the castle I open this up here. That looks like what I want. Create image record. You'll see that it has it brought over the walls and the lighting and the line of sight for me automatically. So if I zoom in here, and remember, this is from an adventure that I'm not even not even planning on running. So get over there. I like to use control and then just make the windows bigger or smaller. All right, so see, it's got light coming through windows. It's got a bunch of little windows that are open or closed, all that sort of stuff. If I now take my players and drop them on the map, combat tracker. Let's grab all my friendly players. Boom. Right. Then I can populate it with where I want my bad guys. Right. And then the players can move themselves around. And if they're doing their movement before, it'll look, you know, more like that. 
when it's locked. If you don't like that, you can just unlock it. You don't want to keep track of all those things. All right. And here's looking through the windows, that sort of stuff. I want to go up here and open the door. They open the door and they look through it. If you want to see what the player sees, turn that on. And now as you pick different players, we'll see different things. So John Bob over here is going to, I'm going to use the number pad. Oops, I clicked off of it, sorry. too many windows open. Up here, and they go up under here, and then they go through. Open that through there. Over the rubble. That's what they see. And then I can populate it with stuff. So uh, let's look at my encounter that I did earlier, right? So I had a Kuatoa patrol. So let's take these, these folks. I'm going to turn off party vision so I can see what I'm doing. And let's say Kuatoa are going to be in this room. So what I'm going to do is slide this over. I'm going to preset. See how it changes to a check mark? They're in the middle of a worship session, I suppose. And wink. Players don't want to go in there, that's for sure. All right, so all of those Kuto are there, that they're all preset. And they're going to be hostile because you're not supposed to be there. And so what happens is, I hit add under the encounter, and now they're all there, right? And now as John Bob, see what he sees. He does not see those guys, by the way. So he comes through here, he comes through, he opens this, boom, to there, opens it. Oh, is it dark in here? I guess it's dark in here. He needs a torch. John Bob is, what is John Bob? Human. Yeah, so John Bob needs a torch. So let's give John Bob a torch. So we need lights. And I got to remember where we put lights. I think it's under effects now. Let's give him a, what do you think? Torch. Give him a torch. Now you can see what the heck he's doing. And as he moves about, he's lighting up that area. Uh, VA Bar God said, is there a way to keep an area open, meaning lit up, once visited with line of sight on? So it kind of just leaves it grayed out. So it tells you, you can see, like they can see this kind of, like this is the revealed stuff that's in the fog of war, but it doesn't stay lit, no. All right, and then I could just do the rest of the stuff like um, before, if I was going to make my own campaigns, I would just fill these with rooms. What's the description of each of these rooms, right? And this, these things don't make sense, but you would basically just populate those. And then that way, when you're running as a GM, you just open it up. Oh, that's, that's what's in this room. And this is what's in this room here. And click the little pin. No, I don't want to do that. The pin is in a bad place. I need to move it someplace other than by the open. But. Okay. If you want to look at, if I look at my library, this is what it would look like. Same thing. 
and an official module. And this is what you want to kind of target when you're making your own campaign. Gives you some good ideas. All right, so lost mine, I found Delver. If I go to the reference manual, Cragmall hideout. Oh, that's the hideout. I need the cave. There it is. Cragmall castle. So this has got the DM version of the map embedded, and then it has a battle map to here, and it has each of these different rooms and descriptions laid out. So these are the same things you could do with your stories. You could do your own encounters. All these same things but if i go to here and i go to the battle map you see it looks pretty much the same but this is a different this is technically a different image record so i can have two versions in the same campaign of the same map but they're actually different because they're different image records if that makes sense this image record has what happens here what's in what's in this room the ruined barracks room, right? It has the box text for these areas. The other one that I have is the one that I made and it's got different pins pushed and it's got different encounters set up. So here I've got this encounter with these goblins that I drop in. Those goblins are there. So it's different. Delete those guys. All right, drink some water here for a second. We're doing all the time. Eleven twenty-one. Should have had David sit in on the call with me. That way, um, we have a little bit of painter back and forth. But I'll try to read the chat and follow up with chat as much as possible. All right, what else can we do? We could do. Um, all right, so yeah, if you're gonna do your own assets, go to assets, go to images, click on the folder button, the folder button. And you guys can't see that, but it basically opens up, it navigates to the folder you want, which is under your campaign folder, and then whatever the name of your campaign is, and then images. Put any images you want there, and then it'll show up under data, and then you've got these things. So it'll, it'll have a campaign folder and a data folder. The difference is there's an images folder in the root of your fantasy grounds, data folder, which is just called images. And you can put stuff in here that you might want to reuse across all campaigns. So like, here's just a background image. If I want to use that, I can use that and say, okay, well, you know, maybe I just use that to set the tone. You're marching in the woods and blah, 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 you know, whatever happens. So uh, when we come out with the theater of the mind extension, you can actually have your NPCs on here as well just to show kind of relative who's all in this particular scene. And then there can be a scene image in the background that you can reuse. Any images that I, that I grabbed basically would just show up there. Okay. If I wanted to look at, uh, let's see, some of the FG stuff, so. Uh, BSG modules are pretty cool. This like dark crypts is kind of neat. City modules, city docks. These are these are basically plug and play tiles. Let's look at dark crypts. So there's brushes, decorations, and tiles. If you're interested in really really delving into this sort of stuff, uh, stay tuned for our seminar tomorrow by uh, Josh Watmaw. He's going to go into this in great detail. And he'll show you how to make your own images and how to do all kinds of really super fancy stuff with images. I'm going to focus more from a high level just to kind of give you, whet your appetite. So here's a bunch of tiles, right? So if you have any tile packs, this is, again, this is uh, Black Scroll Games. It shows up as BSG. Black Scroll Games has got a bunch of little maps like this. And what you can do is you can go to your images and you can just... Say I want to create a new image. Let's make it um, a stinky crypt. You can set the grid. Do you want it to be 100 pixels or 50 pixels or whatever? 
you want the grid to be shown or not shown? What color do you want the grid to be? All that sort of stuff. Uh, and then basically you could drag and drop onto here. And now I've got this guy, uh, boink. I can move it around and use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. I do highly recommend having a mouse wheel. So you're gonna zoom in and out. You can click and hold the mouse wheel and you can pan things around. See this little thing up here at the top? That's a, these are drag handles. So you can drag handle this way or that or this way or that, whatever. Or you can rotate around. If you wanna hold control, see it rotates smoothly. And the nice thing is, I've just modified and messed this whole thing up. So it's all like skewed and all this kind of stuff. But uh, the line of sight is still there. So when I do that, guess what happens? That's still there. Of course, it's not going to snap to another thing, though. So that's not great. So I'm going to go ahead and move that one. I'm just going to add in, drop this one, that one next to it. And let's see, I need two of these guys, that one there, this one here. And you can make these bigger or smaller. You can also switch it to this view. Oh, that looks cool. I need some termination in pieces here. All right, so here's an example. Um, I can drag this in. And you see that I kind of want this to be, if I just dropped it in exactly, right? So if I drop this in here, eh, it kind of works, but it's not exactly what I want. I actually want to flip it, right? So I want it to be this way, like, like that. I want to get rid of this one first. Oops, I got rid of the wrong one. I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna flip it that way. There you go. So now it's got, it gotten flipped. And now the cool thing is, uh, let me find some more. I'm gonna try to finish this out real quick. I apologize. I'm not doing a doing a fantastic job with this, but let's try this one here. There's lots of, all right, here we go, some rooms, right? So let's grab a room, rotate it around, one room there. Um, one room there. You kind of get the idea. I don't have to complete the whole thing, I don't think. Um, I need one more. I'll just do half of it, right? Oops. Leave. Now I go back to play mode. I turn off my grid. I like it when it's not visible. And I got line of sight on, lighting. So I do have uh, John Bob has a torch. So let's throw John Bob in here. This is the player preview version. So now those all linked up. John Bob can explore. So now I can use these and I can place my encounters and all that kind of stuff in here. So, you know, if you've got that kind of asset, you can use that. Another kind of asset you can do, again, uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's stream. It's going to be a lot better. Uh, Clay Ellerbook says, does the image pop up for your players when you click on it from your store? It does not. It's a separate step, so you have a chance to preview it first. 
So again, if I go to my story here, I think I had an image. When I click on it, it does not pop that up. You have to then right click and say share. And you'll notice that when I do this, actually you won't notice because I, I don't have any players connected. It'll actually show the icons of who all has it, who, who can see it. And then that'll be marked as shared. If I was to be in my images section, uh, it will say, oh, there's a little P meaning it's public. So I could say, show me all the shared images. And if I don't want that to be shared anymore, I don't want them to see it. Maybe it's a, they had a glance at a map or a secret note, but they don't own it in their possession. Then I might go back and just remove it. So now it's not shared. All right, so this map here, let's go back to turn off the player vision. Um, assets. The other thing was dark crypts. That was tiles. There's decorations that I could put in, traps, other kind of stuff, hit trap. I could drop this in the middle. Like, let's say he was walking there. And I said, oh, guess what? You just walked into a trap. And there's some spirits down there that want to say hi. You know? Or I could go to brushes. And this is kind of cool. So that could, there's a hallway, right? So I could go to my brush tool drop a hallway in there. And now, let's see, zoom over here. So I'm gonna basically try to see if I can get this lined up just right. To there, click and drag it out. Basically just painted a little tunnel way there. Now, the only difference is, you notice it doesn't have any line of sight. So if I look at line of sight, it kind of stopped there. So I will want to go back and do my line of sight. Oops, that's not what I want. I want to click and drag, do that, that kind of thing. I like to use my arrow keys. Doink, doink. I mean, you can, you can drag your hand down and do it if you want. I can move that later. And then double click to end it. And then I can go back to here and say, select this piece, that piece is, I didn't do a very good job on that. There you go. And then do the same thing for the inside wall. And now that'll be all set up, ready to use. Uh, if you're using an edge piece wall instead, like let's see, I think there's a dark wall here. Let's drop that in, oops. Go to here, paintbrush. Drop that in. Then I can do something like this. Click here. Uh, that's the wrong way. I want to flip it. Like so. Get rid of that layer. Now, um, let's do that. Let's do another piece up here. Someone was really drunk when they did that wall. And I could scale it if I don't like the size of it. And then I can go to line of sight and I can have my painting layer selected and I can say, duplicate the paint layer as walls. And you see what it did? It made it for me. And I can make sure there's no gaps. Yep, looks good. And I could put a little floor underneath that and it's basically ready to play. You can use any image as a brush. It's really just loading an image on here. So any image in your assets you can technically use. It works better when they're top to bottom like that or you're painting floors. If you just wanted to paint floors, you could do that. You just say click, 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 click. Now I've got a bunch of floors, or you can hold the mouse down and paint. Whatever you want. And it does a pretty good job of just kind of making it look usable. So pretty cool. So look for the keyword is brush. Any, any of our things that we have with brushes, we will have written brush. So if you have assets, um, Look at some of our other brushes.
the FG Art Packs, we have Art Pack subscription that we have that gives you hundreds and hundreds of dollars of stuff already. And then on top of that, uh, we'll have more stuff added every month. Subscription. We have lots of brushes. See, this is a pretty cool tunnel here. This is from the FG Underground Map Pack. Let's see, that looks a little small. So let's make it bigger. So you want to resize it. Let's make it a six, six by four. Is that big enough? No, let's make it a really big one. So maybe eight by eight by whatever, right? So you can do the same thing. I'm just single clicking and it bends it around the corner. Double click to end. Oops, sorry. Double click to end. That got a little wonky. Might want to redo that one. We can click and hold. Paint your tunnels. So you can put that on top. Of, like you start out with like a background and then just kind of paint that stuff over top. Definitely hop onto the image stuff tomorrow. Josh does a great job. Uh, Squee Goblin to Bob's got a good tip. Sometimes I create a ridiculous range light source and drop it in the middle of middle of a map to find any holes in my line of sight connectors better than players seeing through walls is there an easier way to do this with gap testing that's a good question that's a, that is a good question um mostly look in here so these you almost have to kind of zoom in real good over time i think you just kind of develop a knack for it so if i was to do a new line of sight what I do when I'm making my line of sight, I always overlap. So if I'm going to paint, let's say I have a new wall coming out right here, right? Then I wouldn't try to just stop at the wall. I actually go inside the wall like that. And it, you see it'll make a little thing for me automatically. Do that again. I'll click and then click there. And then so now what I can do is after I've done that, I can just select this one and then delete that one. Select that one and delete it. So when I'm building my line of sight to make it snap, I just have it make sure it has an intersection. If you have an intersection, you're safe because it doesn't care about the extra over there. It doesn't really matter. The other thing you could do, if you don't want to delete it, which I don't know why you wouldn't want to, is you could just select it and then you can drop it over and it magnetically snaps into that spot. So as long as you're close and you're building it within fancy grounds, it should magnetically snap those. If you, if you screw up and you want to get rid of those, then you double click on the full line I hit delete and it removes that one and then you can delete that one oops undo we did put undo back so that's good double click remove it right you want to have about this many um, lines the fewer points you have the better the performance will be again i don't want to go into that too much just because it's not really that specific to a campaign, although you do see it on all campaigns, you'll, you're going to want to set up your own light sources. Oh, we didn't talk about light sources. I will touch on that super, super briefly. This was a, a dark dungeon, right? But I do want to say I can add a light. I can add a token light or token vision or ambient lighting. Ambient lighting is overall like, you know, if you're outside outdoor map or if there's, you know, glowy green mushrooms throughout the entire area where they can see even a little bit. You know, you might want to load up the ambient light, but if I'm just going to add a light here, I can use a preset and say, okay, I want to have a just a candle. Someone lit a candle there, right? And let's do another one over. Excuse me, here and here. And now, basically, when the player kind of comes around there, you should see. Yeah, you can see there's candles lit up ahead. That's pre-lit. For the player. Okay. Bell put a link to the art pack sub. So if you're curious what's in there, there's loads and loads of stuff in there. Super awesome. All different kind of genres we try to hit and themes and other kind of stuff, but really good, really good brushes and other stuff. And you can just find these online. You can make your own images, your own brushes. Do some really pretty cool stuff we're going to be coming out with like so this is a floor so this would be something you'd want to stamp that on or like do a bunch of four x four drop-ins and then paint stuff around we are working on we will have a like a fill pattern kind of an option oh here's a good one barefoot tracks right so 
that's this is great for dialing it up and making it kind of unique. Uh, let's see, paint. So how big do you want the tracks to be, right? So who went here before? And you can even colorize them. So like, let's say, I don't know why they'd be green, but. So maybe once they made their tracking roll, you could actually show, oh, this is where it goes. Went here, oh, the, and then they might pop over there and then check it for secret doors. And then maybe they go through the secret doors. Lots of cool stuff you can do with the image tools, we think. And the FX tool, same thing. Is it gonna be misty in here? Oh, that's really, really, really fast. Let's slow that down. There you go. For some reason, there's mist inside of this cavern dungeon crypt. Cool. All right, so there's images. Let's see if I'm missing anything else. Go back to my little PowerPoint here. Oh, story templates. Story templates are one of my favorite things. 1141, we have some time. All right, so I'm going to close this down. Story templates, if I look at um, the DMG, let's just look at all story templates. So if I go to story, and then you'll see that there's templates here. If you've ever used Mad Libs, that's what story templates are. So here's a background story template that's out of Xanathar's Guide. So background story. Now I showed this in the other one. Basically, we'll look on all of these tables. There's a table called parents, right? So if I go to tables, There's a parents table. And it basically comes back with two results. You know who your parents are, or you don't know who your parents are. That's kind of boring. That's not super exciting. Uh, let's see. Tiefling parents or half orc parents? So there should be tiefling parents. Tells me about that. Half orc parents tells me about this. So it'll roll in all these charts and it'll put the result in the story for you automatically. Birthplace, same thing. Birthplace. We'll have a list here. Where were you born? You were born on a boat. You were born in a cave, right? So all I have to do, I fill out all of these things that I want to generate, and I hit generate. And it comes up with a story. Now I can modify the story since it's editable. So if I'm not a half orc or a half elf, maybe I'm a tiefling, just delete those things out. And it basically generates content for you. Is there a table that lists how your parents died? It would get used often. Yes. Yes. You, there is not one, I don't think. But let's, let's make one. I'll show you how easy it is to do. So add item. Boom. How your parents died. One. One to four. Horrible fishing accident. Five, eight. Horrible boating accident. And let's add another one here. Um, nine to 20. Um, what would be another one? Died of boredom from a life without adventuring. Good. This is how your parents died. So now, if you want to include this anywhere within the background story here, just unlock it. And then here you've got absent parent, birthplace and details, non-human parents. How did your parents die? Uh, and then we're going to put in parentheses or in brackets how your parents died. 
Get rid of that one. Now we generate. Oh, they died of boredom from a life without adventuring. There you go. And glorious combat eaten by a Gru. I like the Zork reference. That's why you can't go in attics without the light on. <laughs> you guys are funny. Yes. A boat stands for break out another thousand. Because if you've ever owned a boat, there's always something you're having to spend money on. Cool. Uh, story templates. Let's look at some actual other story templates that are there that are like actually legitimate story templates. So background story. Oh, Beholder is quite cool. So this is cool. It has links to things. You can put links and stuff. Here's a table with results that drop in all the tables. So these are all of the, uh, so here's some interesting stuff. So the physical appearance of the beholder just kind of shows here. Every eyeball is going to show with its color, its shape, its size, its texture, eye stalk texture, eye stalk shape, all that sort of stuff. And then its personality and then whatever. And then down below, you'll see this is a chat window that describes it. So it has... Up there, it had brackets. Here, it has um, you know angle brackets instead. That means whatever I rolled before, I want to use down below. Uh, take a look at Story Templates Pro because we've now incorporated that. It's super awesome and um, allows you to do all kinds of really, really crazy stuff that are beyond the scope of this. But there's some great YouTube videos out there um, that you can check out by the author that did a fantastic job. So now hit generate. And now it says, oh, look, I've got first two eyes are yellow, and then I got a violet eye and a brown eye <laughs> and a red eye, all that sort of stuff. And then here I've got my description. So I can now share that with the players. So you can use story templates. You can build this as part of your campaign. I've seen some people do some really, really awesome, clever things where they use it to describe an inn or a tavern or the menu that's maybe available. So if you're one of those people that are creative, to come up with thoughts and ideas, but you're maybe not as good at the improv, you could use this to help you with that. And then when you're running and you're GMing your game, you just kick off the random results and just use it to wing it, you know, come up with some really cool, great ideas. Ajax Lancer said, uh, caught the stream at the perfect time, just picked up Fantasy Grounds and I'm completely lost. It is overwhelming because there's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, we have, there's a group of folks called the Fantasy Grounds Academy, which are all volunteers that they run uh, classes you can go through that are hands-on, you can play around with and stuff. Our community is super friendly, so feel free to you know, hop on Discord and just ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no stupid questions. That's not a challenge, Drake, but there are no stupid questions. So there you go. Lots of cool stuff you can do. Uh, let's see, some other stuff. Buying a magic item. Oh, so buying a magic item is kind of cool. So buying a magic item level one through five. So this is kind of neat. If they go to a magic item shop and you want to let them have some stuff, Instead of going into the store and say, okay, go pick anything out of the player's handbook, then maybe um, you know the store only has limited selection. So it's got some potions of healing and climbing, scroll of zone of truth, but that's all they have, right? And it gave prices for them, price ranges for them. You go to a, a more premium item, you know, it's going to roll against different magic item tables higher on the chart. So these are going to be more rare items. Generate that. They've got a robe of the arch magi. A, a ring of genie summoning. That's a pretty that's a pretty high end shop. And we, you could also look at all of these. Like let's say you don't want it to use magic item table B. You could replace these. Just edit them out and make your own magic item tables. Tables and story templates combination are super powerful together. Here's a random dungeon generator from the DMG. Random settlement. This is great, again, for people who are doing homebrew and they want to populate their world, but they don't want to 
sit and figure out everything. Then here you can just create a bunch of settlements and it tells like what's in each one and then you just fill in the blanks. DMG is full of these things and a lot of people don't use them because to sit there and roll all of these like random table results would be very time consuming. Here, if you just roll one up and you don't like it, like, oh, okay, I want to run a wilderness adventure. Let's use the wilderness adventure framework. And it, it gives me some villains and some other kind of stuff I can use. And I can go through oh, the features that needs to be fixed. That should be a set of uh, table lookups. But it gives you stuff you can use to basically, you know, prompt, prompt you. A chase planner. What happens to people in a chase? If you've never run a chase in, in um, role-playing games, a lot of times people just look at their, you know, everybody has the same speed almost a lot of times. Like, oh, every, every human's got the same speed. So how do you manage an actual chase when I've got 30 foot of movement and you've got 30 foot of movement? Or I've got 40 foot of movement and you've got 30, you can't possibly escape. So that's a little anticlimactic. If you have a monk in the party, then yeah, no one's ever going to escape, right? But maybe use the chase mechanic and now it gives you, all right, who are your participants? What happens? Oh, they ran through a swarm of insects on the way, you know, because this is a wilderness one, right? The monk might be fast, but he didn't realize that there was a hornet's nest that he just had to run through. So now he has to make a DC whatever check to, to avoid it, or he just takes piercing damage <laughs> if he gets hit by the opportunity attack. Maybe he has to stop and deal with that while the bad guy gets away, right? Or maybe the bad guy is faster and the bad guy ran into that. Lots of cool stuff. All right, that's story templates. So let's say you've done all this stuff. You've built your cool uh, campaign. You're all ready to go. You don't have to do anything else to play that campaign. All you have to do is load the campaign up and run it. If you want to load it up and run it for multiple people or you want to share that campaign with other DMs and let them run it, or you want to like sell something on the DM skill, then what you would do instead is you're going to go to your chat window and you're going to say slash export. And it's going to bring up the module export window. Get rid of this. And now you'll just give it a file name. You'll give it a thumbnail. Fill out all of the blanks here. And then what do you want to include? you have classes and backgrounds that you want to include? If so, just check the box. I want all my backgrounds or I want my classes or whatever. Or I want all my random encounters and my other encounters. Or maybe you don't want all the encounters, right? Because if I look here, there's a bunch of other ones I don't want, right? So I want the, all the random encounters, but I only want this Kuatoa Patrol. Just drag it over. I want that one, but not the other ones. Or maybe I want just one of these, right? Select all these things. Story templates, same thing. Do you want all your stories? Do I want all my chapter three stuff? I want, no, I just want my story outline. I want the day's catch. And I want this section and the thing about the moonshade aisles, right? That's all I want. Tables, same thing. Give me all my tables. And then just hit export. And oh, if you would have named it, it makes the mod file for you. Do you want it to be a read-only module or a player module? The stuff that we're building for Fantasy Grounds is built in Fantasy Grounds. So when you go to the store and you see at the library of all of these things, you can build these things here. The only difference is like in the current version, you can't lay out the reference manual in the same way. But all this other stuff, if I go to Story and I go to Lost Mine of Pandelver, right? all of these... You could build all the same stuff and then export it. That's how most of our ventures are actually built by just doing this. And then uh, once, you know, another month or so, once we roll out the reference manual, you'll actually be able to build it out and lay it out so that it looks like this with embedded images and framed out sections that are easy to read and follow. So that's coming soon. Do check out the dev and the test channels once those drop. Probably in another week or two, we're going to drop it in the test channel, I think. 
And then you'll be able to just design this exactly however you want it. Make your own sections, your own headings. This is pretty basic. This is all stuff you could do in story, except for this. You know, you can't have that embedded image until we roll it out with the reference main. Cool. Is there any questions? Is there anything that I didn't really cover that you guys wanted me to cover today? I think that's pretty much it. It's going on towards noon, so I think we I try to hit as much as I possibly could what I think about. I guess also one more thing here is these hotkey bars. If I'm running an adventure, see these 12 bars at the bottom? I use that frequently when I'm running a campaign. So let's say I've got my story text here and I want to go back and forth to uh let's see. Crag Mall Hideout. Let's, let's say I want to use this a lot. I'll just drag that down here. And I say, oh, I also want the map to be here. I'll drop that in. This tells me what's included. And then maybe um, I wanted a part of the book or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I want the index for part two there. Right? Just drop the things that you want for the next session when you're actually running the campaign. Then you just pull it up whenever you want. That way, if I've got this map open, and I do what I sometimes do. I'm not paying attention. I'm like, oh, and I just click X. I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I don't have to go hunt for it in the stories and the list and stuff. I just, you know, come down and just pull it back up again. And it remember, so if I move this around, right? So let's say I'd resized it to this, right? And it could, because I have maybe this and I have the combat tracker. Yeah, I've got them laid out, right? And I close this down, whatever. Then I can basically open it back up and it remembers my, my window dimensions. So uh, IXAX, I don't know how to pronounce that one, said, just to be clear, Doug, you were saying that Fantasy Grounds is getting a new feature. When the new feature drops, we will be able to make the reference manual ourselves, including the nice images, etc. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. We're just, we were fine tuning uh, some additional testing on that. It's pretty good. It's pretty much done. Dominic did that. Uh, Squee Goblin to Bob says, yes, these hotkey bars, there's 12 of them here, but if you hold shift, there's a different set of 12. See, it's S1 through S12. Uh, control gives you C1 through C12. Alt gives you A1 through A12. And then combinations. So shift and control is SC1. Shift control, alt gives you another batch. So you have like 96 of them that you can use. Down below. Uh, so if I want to make a, a question, so if I want to make a rule set for my homebrew rules, I can do it and then put my rules in a reference manual just like the official D&D rule set have. Yes. Yes, you will be able to do that. And you can make it a player reference. So you can have an internal reference for DMs and then a player reference that you mark as being shared. Just remember when you go through your library modules, use these little... Mark it for shared if it's supposed to be shared, right? Or block it if you don't want to block. That way you can have your own reference and then the other stuff. I like to do that if I've got a bunch of custom monsters that I created and I don't want to mess them up. I can use this set to play. I can export those monsters out and they become read only. You can make them read only, for instance, or you don't care because they're in a reference, right? So like, let's say, as an example, I've made some changes to, to my Lost Mine at Fandelver and I want to redo those, then I just go into Modules. I click it, there we go. I go into Modules, and I pull up that module. I can either type in a search here and say Lost Mine, or I can go to the Loaded Filter. And then you're going to right-click on it, and you're going to say Revert Changes. Revert Changes undoes anything I've made. Any changes I've made to this original module will be undone, will be replaced. But let's say, for instance, this story with a kennel. If I don't like a kennel with wolves, I think it's boring to have wolves. 
I can just unlock it and replace this encounter with a different encounter, right? If I want my Kuatoa to be in there, I'll just drop those in instead. Now I've got my Kuatoa. Oops. Doink. Or, let's say I do, I do like the wolves, but I want to have it be stronger, so I'll make six wolves, right? So I unlock that, make six wolves. And now I just have to say, okay, well, where do the other three wolves go? So just pre-place those. Oops. Now when I run Lost Mine at Vandelver and I get to this section, it's going to have the two encounters and it's going to have six wolves. Click boom and now all six wolves are there. I don't want to do all six, I just drop it down to four, whatever. If I want to restore it, I just go back and say, you know, restore the, revert that module. Yeah, so the question, or the comment is, I've been using, been looking at using more core for something homebrew. I will look forward to that new feature because it would be cool for players to see an official looking reference manual. Yeah, that would definitely be cool. And more core is pretty cool. There's, in Fantasy Grounds, if you're using, a, if you want to run a game system that's not one of the official supported systems, uh, like 5th edition or 4th edition D&D or Pathfinder or whatever, uh, we have something called Core RPG, which is very basic. It has all the same kind of like image functionality and, and assets and basic stories and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't know, like if I go to an item, it's not going to know like an armor. What is an armor? Like does it have an armor class? It doesn't know anything about armor class. It doesn't know anything about to hit values or anything like that. Instead, what you're going to use is you're going to use a lot of the dice, the uh, slash die commands to make rolls. And you're going to load those into your character sheets. And your character sheet won't look like a character sheet for D&D. It'll have just empty placeholders. So there's one called More Core, which is some, one that uh, one of our community members, a couple of our community members teamed up on. And they added extra functionality to it. So you can do even more stuff with it. Some cool stuff with you know linking it into the combat tracker. So you can get a similar, or it's somewhat like this. Uh, it won't have the levels of automation that we have, but it'll give you, you know, a portion of that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Is a lot of people don't know how power how sorry how powerful more core actually is. In core RPG, you could do it on core RPG as well. So there's a thing there's a thought that if Fantasy Grounds doesn't have the official rule set, that you can't play the game. Like someone made a comment about, oh, you can't play Shadowrun on Fantasy Grounds. And no, you can play Shadowrun on Fantasy Grounds. I mean, you still have dice and you still have all these other kind of things that'll help you. And if you're using uh, more core, you can even load in some stuff. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's going to be it for me, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your Gen Con. If you're at Gen Con, be safe, be healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again another year. So um, check us out. Follow us on YouTube and on Fantasy Grounds. We're on Twitch TV slash Fantasy Grounds and YouTube.com slash Fantasy Grounds. Pretty easy to find. If you have any questions, pop over on the forums or on Discord. We'll see you there. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.